thanking uh, Dr. Franny Nelson for her work with the department leadership in crafting the agenda. I uh, wanted to thank Brian and Peter, who are the IT support here in the room to get us together with folks that are joining online. Uh, and Peter especially for stepping in to get all this organized. Thanks so much this morning. And to uh, Paula for parking passes and other logistics. Thank you so much. And thank you all of the board members for devoting your time to uh, prepare for this meeting today and attending. I appreciate it as well as I'm sure the agencies that we serve do. Uh, I have regrets from Dr. Uh, Kanapi, who's at a conference in Yale, and Dr. Anasia, who can't join today. I'm aware that Drs. Starr and Vandenberg in Kenya need to leave sometime around one and two. One will probably be around lunch, and we'll take a break at two um, so that we can make sure that you all get out on time. Uh, all of the members are in attendance, which is great. Uh, I think we're going to be joined online. Maybe somebody can confirm whether we are or not already by um, Dr. DeWitt, who's the director of the Environmental Health Sciences Center at Oregon State and still adjunct faculty at ECU. Uh, do we know whether Dr. DeWitt is online? I'm online, Tom. Hi. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much for joining. And we understand that uh, with our revised meeting schedule that you intend to join us in person uh, in the out meetings, which will be great. Yes, that's correct. Well, thanks so much. Uh, with that, I'm just gonna remind you that the mics are live um, because we have people uh, listening online and because we have a transcript going. Uh, when you do talk, please speak into the microphone. It might help to identify yourself. Um, it might help to rephrase a question if you're responding to it so that the recording captures that. Um, just, so just be mindful of it being recorded uh, so that others can access that later, including the folks that are going to prepare minutes. Uh, with that, I think we're ready to review and approve the agenda. The agenda is on the screen now as a draft. It was sent by me on March 27th uh, in follow-up to material that I sent earlier on March 14th, which was the only main action item. Um, the agenda has one charge question to tackle in the, uh, right before lunch, as well as some of our typical uh, agency updates uh, before and after. Uh, are there any questions about the uh, agenda? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adopt it as drafted. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you, Jamie. So that'll be our agenda for the day. And I'll ask Paula, uh, has anybody signed up to be a speaker? I know that the public speaking session is until later, but it's good to know. All right, thanks so much. Uh, with that, if we could have the ethics statement up. Uh, we'll go through that. I'll call it up on my computer and read it while you all look at it online. Thank you, Peter. In accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, it's the duty of every board member to avoid both conflicts of interest and the appearances of conflict. If any board member has a known co conflict of interest or is aware of facts that might create the appearance of such conflict, with respect to any matters coming before the board today, please identify the conflict or the facts that might create the appearance of a conflict to ensure that any inappropriate participation in that matter may be avoided. If at any time any new matter raises a conflict during the meeting, please be sure to identify it at that time. Uh, I'll open the floor to see if there's any board members who are gonna respond to uh, the conflict of interest statement, uh, real or appearances of such. Hi, Tom, this is Jamie. I'd just like to share that I have federal funding to study the toxicity of PFAS, and I serve as a plaintiff's expert witness in cases involving PFAS. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, others? All right, great. Um, 
I think that moves us on to agenda item number four, uh, which is to uh, approve the minutes from the December 6th meeting. Those were uh, drafted by staff and sent around by me on March 27th. Uh, neither Franny nor I have received any suggested changes. Are there any questions or suggestions about the draft minutes? And again, the draft minutes have fallen into a helpful pattern of, of adding links to all of the presentations with timestamps that help anybody go access the material, which I think helps them be briefer. Great. Well, then it would be appropriate for a motion to adopt the draft minutes as final so that they can be posted on the board's website. So moved. John. Uh, thank you, John and Elena. I appreciate it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone Aye. opposed? Thank you, Jamie. Anyone abstaining? Great. Well, that bit of business is done, and uh, we'll have uh, Franny or Paula, whoever handles that next, just move those from draft to final and post them on the uh, website. So just a reminder, as we move into the next agenda item, which is agency updates, it's an opportunity to learn from the agencies we serve and also uh, ask some questions, being mindful in the questioning that we do have an action item coming up that we want to try to make as much progress on as we can before lunch, before we start losing folks. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and also, uh, again, for any questions and answers, please use the microphone and uh, either re uh, if you're responding to a question, rephrase it, or if you're asking it, just identify yourself. I don't know the preferred order. Um, I know that we're going to hear. Okay, so we're going to hear from Assistant Secretary Sushma Maysmore first. Oh, is it? Well, I'll let you guys decide. Good morning, members Good morning. of the board. Thank you for being here. As always, we appreciate your time, talent, and uh, all the resources you provide to us. Um, my updates are, um, I'm going to start off a little bit different. I'm going to give you an update related to a variety of things we're doing under the various federal fundings. Um, our department is uh, in their unprecedented, having an unprecedented opportunity to uh, invest in the future of our state as, as well as our country based on the, the variety of federal legislations that is um, improving the, the state, state of infrastructure and our response to climate change and variety of other energy related um, measures. Um, last week, our department, um, led by our Division of Air Quality and our State Energy Office, submitted a, a grant application to EPA. It's called the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Um, this is about a um, $200 million um, grant on behalf of the state of North Carolina um, that proposes to spend um, funding, if received, um, on greenhouse gas mitigation strategies in homes, in commercial buildings, in industries, in our transportation sector, um, and particularly, it also includes partnerships for two metropolitan areas, uh, Raleigh-Durham and as well as the um, uh, Charlotte area, to partner with them on initiatives uh, related to climate change and greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, this is an enormous effort. We're very proud of the, the work that, that went into uh, producing this grant application. It's following multiple stakeholder meetings, um, getting input from the public and also following the science uh, where our emissions inventory is telling us where the greatest emissions are coming from and where there is the greatest uh, potential for reduction activities. Uh, alongside of that, North Carolina also partnered with other coalitions um, in multi-state coalition applications. Um, the key one is related to the natural working lands. Um, our state partnered with other uh, Southeast states and Maryland um, to submit a separate uh, application. And this looked at the nature-based solutions in enhancing uh, the protection of our natural working lands. Uh, particularly, it focused on measures uh, to protect um, our uh, peatland and our wet wetland um, areas in terms of restoration. Um, it also um, enhances existing forest redevelopment programs and land conservation programs. Um, so this is 
something that we worked on almost three, four years ago. We were pioneers in, in using uh, our natural system as a way to address uh, climate mitigation as well as climate resiliency, but also flood resiliency, uh, and just uh, um, uh, create an ability for a, a good place for North Carolina to enjoy uh, our natural resources and still be an economic driver. Um, so we look forward to EPA's decisions on these major um, uh, grant applications. Alongside, there are other energy, Department of Energy related grant applications and other competitive um, activities that the department is submitting. And maybe in the future I could, if interested, we, we're happy to give you an update on that. Um, and then um, unless there are any questions, I'm gonna transition to the science part. <laughs> Um, and related to the uh, emerging contaminants, I wanted to just give you a quick highlight on um, our department's work related to two key groups of uh, emerging contaminants. One is related to 1,4-dioxane. Um, as you know, 1,4-dioxane is in the minds of many uh, constituents across the state. Uh, the Environmental Management Commission has been hearing about it in the last couple of meetings. Um, it is part of our rulemaking activities, and it will be part of an update that we'll be giving in May at the EMC meeting. Um, the EMC continues to be heavily involved and very interested um, in, in exploring the, the future of the standards for one for dioxane and we, as a department, are continuing to support them in that effort. Alongside of that, the North Carolina General Assembly uh, directed various entities to conduct uh, three different types of studies related to 1,4-dioxane. Uh, one of that study um, requires our department to look at the human health assessment of 1,4-dioxane in drinking water. This is the part of the work that we've asked you all to contribute. And we have a separate team that's, that's putting together, um, building the science and accumulating the science and helping us synthesize that information to provide our legislature with a credible report and Franny is leading that effort. Um, we are uh, providing her guidance and assistance, um, but your team and other expert partners are also uh, heavily involved since January. And today, Franny's gonna give you an update of how that's going. And then in a future meeting, we'll give you um, the, what the recommendations or the final uh, results of that report um, said. That report will also be presented to the EMC and, and we will use uh, that to communicate on our findings. There are two other legislative directives. Um, one is to the Environmental Management Commission to write a report on um, the narrative standards. You may recall the basis of our surface water regulations are how we use a translation mechanism um, to develop those surface water discharge um, standards. Um, that report is being developed um, with EMC members and it should be um, prepared and delivered by June 1 is the target date as required in the legislation. And then finally, there's a third study that looks at the 1,4-dioxane costs and benefits of technologies and um, solutions for reducing um, the concentration of that pollutant. And there's a, uh, the collaboratory is assigned to, to lead that study and uh, uh, we are talking with them and providing um, guidance as they request. Um, um, and that work is going well, and that will be the numbers on the cost side that the many constituents are looking for. Um, so your part here is important, um, as you see, as a, as a multifaceted uh, approach towards this one particular emerging contaminant. Um, so we'll, we look forward to talking about that. Uh, transitioning to PFAS, um, you all have heard about, you know, for the last couple of years, a variety of updates. The key ones that I want to bring to your attention is um, related to drinking water standards. Uh, EPA uh, sets the primary national drinking water standards for um, contaminants, and they plan to issue that for uh, six PFAS constituents. Um, you may recall we presented to you the proposed levels and the basis for those proposed levels. Um, we are hearing that EPA will soon um, finalize those levels and make will be making announcement um, in the near future. And that scientific basis for the toxicity assessments and the human health analysis is the foundation for the state um, delegation of the Clean Water Act. Uh, under the Clean Water Act, the states are required to 
address any emerging contaminants or contaminants of interest that are found in the state that have um, toxicity impacts and is a toxic pollutant. Um, so this is something that we have been working with you all and letting you know um, that our team in the Division of Waste Management and the Division of Water Resources is working on both groundwater standards as well as surface water standards, which are under the purview of the state and the DEQ and the EMC. Um, it's, a, it's a long road, but it is a very, uh, hopefully a systematic and a scientific process that we hope to create transparency around that. So today you hear a presentation from Franny uh, related to an ask we're having um, on, on PFAS related rulemaking. Um, the, the health assessment studies that have been the foundation of that, uh, of those PFAS that we're proposing to regulate. And then secondly, you'll get an update from Stephanie on what the fiscal analysis, the, the, the foundation for rulemaking will consist of for these group of eight PFAS chemicals. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that we talked about drinking water systems that will be affected by the EPA's uh, proposed and soon to be finalized regulation. North Carolina has over 2,200 such systems. Um, our Division of Water Resources Public Water Supply Team has been working with those systems to monitor and get an initial assessment of what levels of those PFAS that EPA plans to regulate are at. Uh, so we have a good indication of which of our systems are going to most likely exceed uh, the proposed and soon to be finalized standards. And so we've been working with them, communicating, we've been working with some utilities on what's uh, the best way for them to come into compliance. Uh, EPA will set a schedule, usually it's three uh, so years after the promulgation uh, that those systems will have to comply. Um, if there's any interest in wanting to know more, um, we can certainly provide the data. Um, we have small systems, large systems, community-based systems, schools, daycares. We're finishing up our la last group of, uh, um, of drinking water systems, so we should have a good, good uh, um, perspective uh, of where we stand at a state. And just want to emphasize is this process that the Division of Water Resources has embarked on is one of the um, most progressive in the, in the whole country in terms of getting a handle on what our drinking water systems are at. Um, so we will have one of the most robust and comprehensive data set uh, to be able to make informed decisions and to be able to allocate financial resources and technical resources to those areas that needed that um, service the most. Um, also, um, as a variety of things that our department is doing on PFAS monitoring and sampling, our Division of Water Resources completed our, our groundwater ambient monitoring of PFAS. Um, so that information is available and we have a good sense of which of our ambient monitors, um, the groundwater monitors that are in the ambient network um, are, are uh, exceeding a proposed standard um, from EPA as well as our our own uh, future proposed standards. All of these data sets is now uh, allowing us to get a, a good understanding of potentially where key areas to focus are um, and perhaps potentially sources and also communities that are affected. Um, so our division of waste management is, is um, heavily involved in uh, using the Bernard Allen Fund, which is uh, appropriated by the legislature, uh, to sample potentially those receptors around those sources that we may think are potential hot spots, um, and also areas of sources that may that are that are connected with um, with PFAS discharges. Um, so the Bernard Allen Fund is available for affected homeowners to ask for sampling, testing, bottled waters, and if needed, uh, based on criteria that's been established by our group, um, risk filtration options. And if you're interested in that, we can have Michael come up and talk about that too. And then finally, um, one of the biggest uh, areas that we as a department spend most of our time in is the uh, implementation of our consent order with, with the Camorra site. Um, just a key updates on that. Um, we continue to ask some tough questions regarding the approach towards what we call the step out plan of how um, residences from, from the centroid of the facility to how far out um, and at the what pace of uh, sampling those homeowners are quickly brought to 
um, filtration and clean water supply. So first of all, we need to get out and have Comoros test them and we have a plan. And we're really closely looking at the effectiveness of that plan um, with by looking at the data and the extent of uh, some um, um, understanding of what, what the math is showing us regarding the extent of contamination. So in some places we're out 20 plus miles. In some places we may have to be uh, out even further than that. And so we're trying to, uh, after the data that's been collected for a couple of years, trying to establish that outer boundary, and that'll give us the the area that eventually will need to be uh, tested throughout uh, between those those layers. That's happening. Um, we're continuing to also work with Comores and the Lower Cape Fear uh, counties um, on their testing plan and the um, um, the variety of things that are happening there. We have a uh, a plan that, that that's on our website that explains what we're doing there. Um, just as a high level, we have about 1,600 or so residences whose wells are exceeding the Comores consent order um, criteria for those chemicals. And so those um, homeowners that are eligible for filtration options are, are being um, um, supplied that, but also some of them are um, cap uh, eligible for municipal connections. And so Michael and his team are working with the counties and Comores to look at the feasibility plans for connecting those homeowners to a municipal supply. It's quite complicated and multifaceted, um, but it is an ongoing effort. Uh, we continue to test and sample and require uh, the facility to um, um, maintain and conduct a variety of um, testing uh, to ensure that we fully understand and continue to build that knowledge um, regarding their operations. And then finally, I wanted to highlight um, a few source-related activities that the department is working on. Our Division of Waste Management, um, back in July, you may, may have remember, remembered, uh, we issued a memo to solid waste um, directors and landfill operators um, that uh, starting July 2023, um, to monitor uh, in their groundwater, surface water, and leachate, if they have it, uh, for the presence of PFAS chemicals using the methods that we identified. Um, and we're getting those results um, now, and we've had a chance to look at the, some of the, uh, the results. And we have shared this publicly regarding one particular landfill, and that is the Samson County Landfill Facility. It is um, owned and operated by GFL. One of the board members asked questions on it, so I wanted to, to give you a little more detail on that. Um, at this facility, um, we did um, find and they did report significant amounts of PFAS contamination in their groundwater and also the leachate that is being transported. Um, we are working very closely with the facility, uh, wastewater treatment plant, as well as the community. Um, we had a public meeting in Roseboro in November um, and we went walk through the data that we had and all the knowledge that we had at that time. And our two to three divisions are involved in, in uh, assessing the site, um, understanding the profile of how the uh, contamination potentially could be transported to other um, offsite uh, receptors. But thus far, um, we have been testing to about 2,000 feet, 2, feet out from the landfill. Um, 30 drinking water wells have been tested, um, and five of them are on bottled water um, for PFO and PFOS. Um, but we are detecting, at least on the landfill, um, the same chemicals that are common across the, the state, across the nation, and across the world, um, but also some of the Comores signature compounds that are unique to North Carolina. Um, so we continue to, um, to understand the data, but also get people on clean water as soon as we we find that. Um, and if there are any questions on this, and we have a full team of division waste management leadership here to answer. So with that, I think I'm gonna pause. I hope this was helpful and happy to get into anything else. Yes, quite helpful. Thank you, Assistant Secretary. Uh, I'll ask for questions um, if anybody on the board has them or Jamie online as well for Assistant Secretary Macemore. I'll note that we do have updates uh, after lunch on the PFAS rulemaking, as well as the 1-4 dioxane study, so there'll be a little, an opportunity for a deeper dive there. But are there any questions for Assistant Secretary Macemore on all of the uh, helpful information regarding using existing tools? 
to manage sources and environmental protection, as well as developing new ones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I understand that we're joined online by Dr. Zach Mord. Zach is the state epidemiologist and epidemiology section chief who's going to provide the update from DHHS. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you really good. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Oxberger and uh, board members. I apologize. I can't be with you in person today. Um, I will be brief with my updates. I wanted to touch on a couple of items that have been um, generating some attention recently. The first, briefly, I wanted to um, share with the board information about avian influenza detections. Um, we have been in contact with CDC. We're notified rapidly um, when there was a case an infection identified in a person in Texas who had been in contact with uh, dairy cattle herds where avian influenza had been identified. So we have been working with our colleagues in the Department of Agriculture, um, making sure that we are prepared here in North Carolina. Um, just very brief recap, this is the same um, highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 that's been circulating um, in this country since 2002. We've had uh, initially wild bird and then domestic poultry outbreaks. There's been a um, growing number of detections in mammals and now more recently in uh, livestock with detections in goats and in uh, cattle herd in Texas or cattle herds in Texas. Uh, we have not had any known cases. We have had um, animal cases and poultry farm um, detections here, including two poultry farms this year already. Um, but we have not had any any human cases, no detections in um, in herds in North Carolina. Um, so we are, you know, sharing some of the guidance that's been released by CDC and other organizations, specifically with the emergence in dairy herds that people should not um, consume or prepare foods that are uh, contain raw or unpasteurized milk in North Carolina. Uh, milk that's sold for human consumption is required to be pasteurized and is safe to drink, but this is an important opportunity to reiterate that message. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. One other update on an item that's been in the news, not as recent, but just to provide a, a brief update regarding the investigation of lead poisoning linked to cinnamon applesauce pouches. Um, I think this has been shared at a high level before with this board. This was a discovery that was made here in North Carolina by our public health teams, initially part of a routine investigation of elevated blood lead levels in children um, that was being conducted in the western part of the state. The, there were no sources identified in the home for those children, and the public health investigators spoke with the parents, identified frequent consumption of a particular brand of cinnamon applesauce pouches. Um, so testing of those pouches was done here at our North Carolina State Public Health Laboratory and identified very high levels of lead. So we involved our federal partners immediately. Um, that has led to a voluntary recall and an investigation, now an international investigation led by the FDA. Um, as of the most recent <clears throat> report po posted on the CDC website uh, a couple weeks ago now, there were 519 cases of lead poisoning linked to this particular um, product. Um, and the investigation identified that contamination with lead roommate was occurring um, where the cinnamon was being produced in Ecuador with the leading hypothesis from FDA that this was likely economically motivated adulteration with lead chromate being added to increase the weight and, um, you know, there's also adding sweetness to the uh, to the cinnamon products. So um, there's a lot more information on that, but I did want to bring it up for for this group for awareness. Um, this okay. is a really um, amazing example of, of public health routine public health action in pro in you know in practice and the types of things that um, 
that can be identified there. A um, couple other things to note, environmental justice. I know we've talked before, Dr. Guidry, who is uh, not able to be with us today has mentioned some of these things, but just to give a brief update, you know, there are now two executive orders that the governor has issued relating to environmental justice. There was one back in January of 22, which was uh, environment, uh, executive order 246 that um, required cabinet agencies to consider environmental justice uh, when taking actions related to climate change and clean energy and to identify environmental justice leads. So, uh, the more recent development was the issuance in October of last year of Executive Order 292, and that order reestablished what had been the um, DEQ Environmental Justice and Equity Advisory Board, and now is the Governor's Environmental Justice Advisory Council, with the intent being to take a whole of government approach to environmental justice concerns. So, all cabinet agencies were charged with identifying their top environmental justice goals and measurable outcomes. Those have all been posted on the EJ Advisory Council website now, are available um, if you want to dig into those. This Advisory Council is chaired by Dr. Guidry, as well as Dr. James Johnson, who is uh, from UNC, uh, Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. They've already are, have launched and have had a couple of meetings so far. Um, more information about that is available on the Environmental Justice um, Advisory Council website. Um, and then finally, just a notice to members of the board or others who may be participating that we do have a webinar coming up regarding navigating North Carolina's rising temperatures and understanding and addressing heat um, and risks of uh, heat related illness. So this is going to present evidence based strategies for reducing heat related illness and highlight some measures that are already being taken at the local and state levels. And we'll have representation from our team, as well as our state climate office, the Duke University heat policy innovation hub. We've got um, folks joining from NOAA from 1 of our local health departments in Chatham County. That's been active in this area and the emergency management. Um, Office of Recovery and Resiliency. So that will be Wednesday, April 17th. So coming up in a, a couple of weeks, and I will <coughs> provide more information um, to those who might be interested. Um, I believe those are the only updates I have for this morning, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Zach. We appreciate it. Uh, are there questions from board members in the room or Jamie online? I have one time. John Vandenberg has a question for you. Uh, Zach, thank you very much. I think a lot of urban areas have a residual lead contamination. And I think in the last few months, we've heard about some playgrounds in Durham that have had uh, lead levels identified by a Duke researcher and his, his team. Is there any um, approach to look at sort of the broader scale or more focused uh, lead contamination in, in urban areas? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I don't have um, much information to share on that. <clears throat> Obviously, we have been aware and have been um, speaking with, with Durham County and others about the issues with identification of lead and soil at playgrounds and other public spaces. Um, and I think this is sort of a, a growing area of interest as we try to identify sources in children with elevated blood lead levels where there is no in-home contamination identified. So food sources, <laughs> as we've just seen with the applesauce is one, but then there are also these other potential sources outside the home that need to be considered. Um, so I think there's definitely growing interest and awareness in um, trying to determine how we can better identify some of those maybe shared exposure sources, but I don't have anything specific on Contamination of uh, of soils and you know playgrounds or other public spaces to share right now. I can check with our environmental uh, environmental health section team and get back to you with any updates they might be able to provide. The one thing that I would add, and thank you, Zach, and this is Betsy, is um, <clears throat> our environmental health team does have funding to um, look at water at both um, child care and schools. So for our, especially around the concern of pipes and solder. So we have a very robust 
uh, lead testing of water sources and some uh, dollars to remediate if we find that in um, uh, early childhood education and K-12 schools. So not so much the soil, but the water testing where we have robust activities in there. Thank you. Thanks for the question, John, and response, Zach. And it's good to have the state health director in the room as well. Thank you, Betsy. Any other questions? Just one question. Uh, Tom Starr has a question for you, Zach. Zach, uh, can you say any more about what, what the symptoms for the lead poisoning were, the 500 cases of applesauce poisoning? That'd be useful to know. Yeah, and you know, I think as folks know, it sometimes takes a while to identify um, sequelae of lead poisoning. So the case definition for being considered a case for this investigation is just based on a blood lead level of um, 3.5 micrograms per deciliter or higher and having had exposure to these products. It's not just the Wanabana. There's actually a couple other brands that were using the same cinnamon. Um, so it doesn't, I don't have any clinical information, um, but there is definitely interest in sort of following over time to understand the public health impacts of this, you know, very large uh, contamination um, poisoning event. And, and I will add, at least those initial cases that we detected, it was routine screening. So this was that um, just, again, there weren't, these children weren't symptomatic. It was just our routine screening in our pediatrician's offices. They do those lead screening and it was detected that way through our, our routine process. Thanks for the question, Tom. Uh, other questions? Comments? Jamie, we're mindful that you're online. Do you have any questions or comments before we move along? I do not. Thank you for asking. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Zach. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, that moves us to uh, item number six on the agenda, which is the main action item. I want to pause for a second, though, because this is going to take us to lunch and just ask for the board members in the room. Uh, you have two choices. We could introduce the topic to frame it and then take a break and come back and discuss it. Or we could take a break now and come back and frame it and discuss it. I'm just thinking that, you know, sometime between now and noon would be good to take a break. And we can either take a break and then come back and tee it up. Or we can have Franny tee it up, take a break, and then come back and discuss it. Do you have a preference? I'd move on. Keep going. Yeah. Number two. All right. Then uh, I'm going to say, you know, the state's PFAS strategy, uh, you know, builds from EPA's strategic roadmap, and it does so in part to take advantage of the national level actions that EPA is doing for the relatively data rich PFAS, like PFOA, PFOS, the Gen X, and the related compounds. Uh, you heard in December at this meeting, DEQ's presentation, that they plan to propose groundwater standards and surface water standards. And those surface water standards would be under their rules, 15A NCAC 2B, the, the part there about um, toxic materials for 8 PFAS. That includes the ones that EPA is being is advancing drinking water standards for that you heard Sushma mention this morning, and two additional ones. All eight of those compounds uh, have um, toxicological literature that's been synthesized by others, and importantly, uh, through the work that the department has done to characterize exposure, all eight of those compounds have been detected in surface waters of North Carolina. Uh, so we're responding to a uh, charge that has been given to us by DEQ. Uh, DEQ is in the process of developing their regulatory path forward on these eight PFAS, and they're the ones who are requesting our input as part of their PFAS rulemaking processes. Uh, we distributed the charge and some supporting material after the December discussion in March. And Franny's going to uh, freshen us up on what the uh, request is of the background materials, and then we'll dive in. So, uh, Franny, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. 
Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Um, I'm going to go over. Hey, I myself. I'm going to just go over um, some background information, and then um, I guess specifically what the the ask from DEQ is. Um, and then I have um, the Excel files and things that I shared with you previously to pull up if, if we want to look at that together um, or if you want to look at it separately, that's fine too. Um, so this is um, in relation to the action item with the PFAS toxicity assessment review. Um, first, there are eight PFAS that DEQ is proposing for standards development, and they are these eight. So six of these have been included in the EPA's National Primary Drinking Water Regulation that they proposed uh, about a year ago. And two of the others have been produced by the EPA's IRIS program but are not included in that regulation. These, these compounds were chosen um, because they all have a significant literature base, and so health effects can be determined or have been determined through these assessments. Um, all of the literature bases for these eight compounds have been evaluated by at least one federal agency, if not two. Um, these compounds all have health effects data to support the development of a reference dose or a cancer slope factor where the data is appropriate. And all of these compounds have been detected in North Carolina's environmental media. And so in all media sampled, soil, sediment, water, um, and air, they've all been detected in. Um, just for a refresher, um, the toxicological values we need to calculate these standards are a reference dose for all of them, um, a cancer slope factor or a potency factor, as it used to be called for the likely or known human carcinogens, and then a bioaccumulation factor, which we've discussed previously, and that's only used for surface water standards. The sources of the reference doses are varied, and that's kind of where the basis for this charge has come from. Um, four of these PFAS have been evaluated by the EPA's Office of Water, and their toxicity assessments have come from the Office of Water. Um, these four PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, GenX, and PFBS are also included in the EPA's um, maximum contaminant levels and their national primary drinking water regulation. There are two that are not included in that, and they are from the IRIS program. They are PFBA and PFHXA. Um, and then there are two that were evaluated by the CDC's Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry that are included in the EPA's National Primary Drinking Water Regulation, and they're PFNA and PFHXS. Um, for our, um, I've got to get this little thing out of the way here. Um, for our water quality standards, there are different things that are required for surface water and groundwater. And so this is just a refresher from a presentation that we had, I guess, about two years ago now, where we went over all the different rules that DEQ has. Um, the requirements are different, and so I'll start with groundwater, even though it's on the, the right side. Um, for our groundwater rules, the reference doses um, are allowed to be pulled from any of these four reference types in order of preference. So number one is the highest order of preference, and that's the EPA's Integrated Risk Information System, or their IRIS program, um, the second being a drinking water health advisory, the third just being other EPA health risk assessment data, and then four is other relevant published health assessment data, scientifically valid, published, peer-reviewed toxicological data. Um, that's pretty straightforward. It includes a lot of different um, options for sources of this information, um, and this is written in our rules. For surface water, which is on the left side, it's a little more specific. Um, and so for groundwater, I don't have it on this slide, but the reference dose or the cancer slope factor is chosen based on whichever number is lowest and most protective. That's very clear and it's written in the rules and there's nothing to, to jumble around there. It's very straightforward. Um, for surface water, it's not as clear. So the reference dose can come from three places. Um, the first being something that's published by the EPA for the Clean Water Act. So section 304A of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Um, that's the Clean Water Act. Um, also um, issued by the EPA as listed in the IRS system or as approved by the director after consultation with the state health director. Um, those are the three places that our rules specifically say we can take a reference dose from. For the cancer slope factor, the only thing that it says in our rules is an unacceptable health risk for cancer, 
to be more than one case per million people exposed. So that's a one in a million risk level. Um, that's pretty standard across all of our regulatory programs, but that's the specific language for that in our rules. And that's um, that just makes the choice between a reference dose and a cancer slope factor a little less clear in surface water. Um, but for most cases, there's only a reference dose. So it's not much of an issue for most of the PFAS. Um, sorry. Okay, so the toxicity assessment information. Um, these are from the EPA and the CDC programs. They're used for the foundation of this national primary drinking water regulation that the EPA is proposing. The fact that the EPA has included these in their national primary drinking water regulation suggests and really underscores that these assessments are very high quality scientific reports and they are suitable for rulemaking. If the EPA didn't feel that these were high quality enough to include in rulemaking, they wouldn't have included them in their national primary drinking water regulation. The EPA has also proposed an IRIS assessment handbook that was designed for EPA staff and includes these detailed methods for conducting assessments done by the IRIS program. They did this basically so there is synergy across all of the offices that work on the IRIS program, which crosses most multiple organization or divisional sections within the EPA and also geographic locations. So it's not just one office and one group of people that do it, it's many. And they created this handbook, so it was a very clear, um, systematic way to go through this assessment. The handbook, based on what it is, contains detailed methods for conducting these assessments and making sure they have the same rigor and scientific support as all of the assessments done by the rest of the IRIS program. This gives us a basis of comparison for all of the things that are required by the IRIS program. Um, what we're asking um, is that the board review the tables that I summarized, um, which are really just summaries of the longer toxicity assessments, and determine um, if these assessments that have come from other federal programs are consistent with the IRIS handbook guidelines. Um, and so our charge question specifically is, are these EPA and CDC assessments adequate and of comparable quality to the EPA's IRIS assessments? And if they're not, what aspects of this assessment is not of comparable quality? We know they're all of high quality because they're included in this regulation the EPA has proposed. Um, based on what our rules say, we just want to ensure that these are all appropriate and of the same scientific rigor so when we move forward with rulemaking, we have a robust amount of support for the numbers we propose. Um, I think that's my last second. Yeah, that's it. Um, so I can answer questions. Um, Sushma is also available to answer questions. Yeah. I can't. Well, thank you for teeing it back up again. I'll remind people that the other part of surface water uh, regulations was the uh, bioaccumulation factor. And you know, last year we reviewed and provided input on those. So this is an evolution of that. The only other thing that's needed for the surface water standards are these reference doses, and they're proposing to come from a variety of sources. They're now asking for our input on the adequacy of those sources. Uh, I'd suggest that we first ask uh, questions related to clarity on the charge, and then once there's no more questions on clarity of the charge, then any questions for Franny on the uh, background material, and then we could move in discussion of it. But are there any questions first on the charge question that's in front of us, which is identical to the one that was emailed to you on March 17th? I have a question about why uh, we haven't asked EPA to comment on these issues of balance or equality or consistency between the, the things. They, they're already on the record for six out of the eight. And the other two are CDC values that EPA has has taken taken, right? Mm -hmm. Accepted. And if there are differences, like there are in this one, uh, I'd like to hear what EPA has to say about it. That's one question. Uh, why haven't we asked them? Have they have they denied or, or uh, refused to do that? The other one has to do with the EPA handbook. Mm -hmm. That's a relatively recent uh, publication of EPA, and uh, we've never been briefed on what's in it. I have a copy of it, and I've looked at it extensively, and um, 
I think it would be useful to have maybe some of the authors uh, give us a, a, a 10,000 foot level look at the whole handbook and uh, get a sense of what's in it, other than these broad brush uh, statements about dose response modeling and systematic review and hazard identification, which is a little too high for my, my interest. So would, uh, would you guys be interested in having EPA give us a talk like that? I can certainly request one. Um, we have spoken to the EPA about the specific, um, I guess, topic. And the people that I've spoken to have routinely referred me to um, a lot of their materials that um, indicate all of this is appropriate for the Section 304A of the Federal Pollution Prevention Control Act, um, the Clean Water Act. Um, a lot of the the newer methods before 1633 was finalized was included in all of that material, saying that this is you know, the most validated PFAS method and that it's appropriate for use in these in these uh, rulemaking activities. And so they've they've said that they are appropriate for use and that they are you know of enough scientific rigor to include in their regulation, um, and that. Those materials are certainly going to be included in the supporting information for our rulemaking proposal. Um, we just thought it would be helpful to have all of your opinions weighed in on the same issue. Um, that way it's not just coming from resources that EPA has put out for everyone. It's specific to our science advisory board and um, you know, the, the opinions of those that reside in North Carolina. I'm going to back it up just a second. Uh, I do want clarity on the charge question before we start discussing. So the charge question is to the board. I gather, you know, another way to get an answer to the question would be to ask EPA, and we can do that. But just to make sure that we're all answering the same question, I'm going to look around the room. Are you clear on the charge question? I don't want to belabor it, but I also don't, I also don't want to make sure that we're, like, somebody has a question about, well, what do you mean by adequate or what's comparable, and they want more information on that. But are you good with the charge question? Yeah. Okay. Jamie, are you good with the charge question? I am. Thank you. Okay. And then I'll say, you know, I think in terms of a suggestion for how to respond to the charge question could be to get EPA's advice on the things that were uh, different. But I don't know that that, you know, negates the ability for the board to discuss it as well and provide our own feedback, which is what we're being asked to do. I understand. That. Gotcha. And yeah. I, I'm, I understand that you're asking us to opine on this, but mm -hmm. it would be useful in our developing an opinion about this to know what EPA has said. And what you're telling me is that basically EPA is okay with the inter-office differences and in process that led to having all six, only two of which are IRIS derived, and the other two that are CDC derived. Is that the right? two that are derived from the IRIS program are not included in the National Primary Drinking Water Regulation, which I think is interesting. The two um, IRIS ones are not? They're not. They're not. No, it's the other six. So it's four oh, from the Office okay. of Water and two from the CDC. Okay, okay. Which I think is, is just an interesting approach. Well, that doesn't mean that they're they're uh, rejecting those values. No, they're not. They're just not included in, in this regulation they've proposed already. Okay. And to your point, I mean, one thing that I – found interesting in re referencing all the materials and then actually looking at the links that were in there. Um, there is an EPA companion document where they review the two ATSDR uh, summaries, summarize them. Again, they didn't redo the analysis, but they did add an additional safety factor on there for their particular application mm -hmm. to go from uh, intermediate to chronic, another factor of 10. So, right. I think to your point, you know, about what does EPA think about them, they still are proposing to use them, and they did uh, a separate document to dive into what the derivation was and then what they would need to uh, append to that to be able to use it for their application. I mean, these are big differences we're talking about, two orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. some of the, the values, comparable, so-called so comparable values. That's a big difference in my I, no, so no. the um, the EPA is not using the ATSDR values for PFOS and PFOA. They're using the own, their own derived ones that are yeah. much smaller, um, and that's because it was done more recently and also is done in a reference dose fashion rather than an intermediate 
risk level. Mm -hmm. um, the other two that are from the CDC, I um, can't remember what they are, I'll just put those up. Um, one of them was the intermediate risk level was derived from a developmental endpoint. And so the EPA just took that value and applied that to their equation. The other was not from a developmental health endpoint. It was from an in-life endpoint. And so that is the one that they added the additional uncertainty factor to, um, to make it appropriate for a chronic uh, reference dose calculation. So Tom, in terms of the two things that you brought up, an overall presentation on the IRIS methodology, which would be useful going forward anyway, it'll be in the notes. And um, uh, EPA, as another source of information on this exact same question, seems like something that we should be able to do simultaneously, right? I think so. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, because otherwise it's an inference, right, about whether or not they had any concerns just because they're using them for the primary drinking water standards rules. You could infer that so they're totally good, or you could infer that they had some concerns that might not have been fully expressed. So right. we could check it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Jamie, I just... All right. Uh, Jamie yeah, and then what? John, because I think John was looking for the microphone. Elaine is going to go after you, Jamie, but you have the floor. Okay. What is the best way for me to jump in if I have a question? Just do what I did on mute and... Uh, yeah, please, because I can't see uh, otherwise. That's going to be totally fine with me. We'll manage it. Okay. So in the, the maximum contaminant level documents for uh, Gen X, PFB, uh, S, PFNA, and PFHXS, the US EPA does provide a little bit of context about those ATSDR MRLs. I'm, I'm trying to find my document so that I can read the precise information and I can jump in later when I find that. But just just as a point, the US EPA didn't just pluck these numbers and pop them in. They did provide a little bit of context about why they chose them and why they believe that the ATSDR approach was appropriate for uh, the MCL derivation. Yeah, and you probably said it better than I did, but that's what I was referring to. There's an EPA document, I'll send it to the link to Franny to post for others. It's EPA 822P23004. It is referenced in the Federal Register announcement of their proposed rulemaking. It's uh, their review of the, uh, the scientific literature for Gen X, ammonia salts, PFBS, PFNA, and PF. XHS. So it includes these two that came from ASTDR. And to Jamie's point, that document says that uh, they reviewed the literature themselves. They're referring people to ATSDR for additional detail. But then they take the primary study and dissect it again. They explain how the uh, reference dose was derived they explain how they're going to add another safety factor onto it to adopt it as their own reference dose. And in the material that um, Franny showed us on an earlier slide, I think that she had two citations, and that's probably what the second citation is, the EPA 2023. There's the ATSDR 2021, and then there's the EPA 2023. Maybe it's a little bit later. It might be a different presentation, but yeah, the EPA 2023 is is the Federal Register. So yeah, there's one indication at least where EPA didn't just adopt it; they evaluated it and then applied an additional safety factor to it, and then called it their own. <clears throat> Anything else, Jamie? While you have the floor, uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay, uh, Elena was next. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to step back and take a more, a longer view. What we're really being asked about is the comparability of the methods. And as you indicated, the uh, IRIS handbook is, does provide a lot of detail in terms of the methods. ATSDR also has a draft handbook for that was published in 2018. I don't know if it's been finalized. So they have a document for MRL development that is similar 
to uh, in, in terms of providing guidance for things like systematic review, study selection, and study evaluation criteria. So they have a document like this. I just don't know if it's been finalized or not. And I think the more seminal question is whether or not those methods were actually used for any individual uh, assessments of any individual compounds that we might evaluate. Um, the second point, and this plays to an observation that Tom made, is that ATS, EPA, RFDs, and RFCs are a lifetime exposure limit, um, that a lifetime health-based guidance value. And that's distinct, I'm making the distinction, health-based guidance value distinct from a standard. Um, so those are lifetime. Uh, the MRLs are, and and the also the RFDs are and RFCs are used for comparability across agency assessments, um, and to leverage the work that each different office may be doing. In the case of the MRLs, those are also derived for for a very specific purpose. Um, ATSDR uses their MRLs as a non-regulatory screening level levels at hazardous waste sites and in emergency response activities to quickly but safely rule out exposures that do not pose human health risks. And the so they're used for different purposes. And if you look at the length of time, chronic MRLs are for 365 days or more. So, but an RFD is a lifetime, so a lifetime exposure. And again, this stems from that they're using them for different purposes. So the fact that you would come up with rather different, might come up with different values is a function of the purpose for which those health-based guidance values are being used. And um, that, what I was reading was a direct quote from that uh, paper that you sent to us. That you sent to us, thank you. Yeah. So that's that's just the the higher, the, the the broader outlook I'd like to I'd like to for us to be aware of. Yeah, it's a good point because I do think that the way that I interpreted the charge question is it has more to do with approach than specific endpoints. To evaluate the specific endpoints, you'd have to do your own dive into all eight of these documents and uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, agree or vary with every decision that's been made along the way because reasonable people could take those sets of documents and come up, could come up with different conclusions. But process-wise, you know, they were both based on in this uh, table that Franny shared with us, at least for the ATSDR, you do have, you know, what methods they used, what databases they searched, what data sieves they used to retain data, that they used an expert peer review panel to retain studies or drop studies. The differences that I saw in the methodologies was uh, ATSDR was using you know, NOELs as their basis instead of benchmark dose modeling, which IRIS would do. But EPA was aware of that in that document we just cited. That was one of the reasons that they then, uh, for the lifetime of exposure as well, was one of the reasons they did the further divide by 10 at the end before they adopted it as their own reference dose. So I do think that there is a way to approach that question about overall methodologies. And then I think another dive, which I think is what DEQ is asking is, in this case, are the methods that they used, you know, sound enough, which goes to your point of how well did they follow the published method. So we've got, you know, Franny's tab three are the two methods compared, but her tab one, I think, is the more important question, which is in this case, are the derivations of the RFDs of comparable quality to IRIS? Yeah, go ahead. Um, another clarification. If you look at the uh, old AT at ATSDR documents and you read their draft guidance, they don't just use NOELs. They do use benchmark dose modeling, and they do that whenever the data, the data pass the appropriate criteria to be amenable to dose response modeling. So right. ATSDR do does use benchmark dose modeling in some instances. Yeah, and so I, I think I included it in that table, but the 
um, that draft ATSDR method or, or handbook um, is what they based those assessments on, but then they also had an additional protocol that they used for the perfluoroalkyl assessment that they did. And so that's a separate document um, that had a more detailed um, set of procedures that was more closely related to the way that the IRIS documents and the other assessments were written out. Um, just had a lot more detail included than the 2018 guidance. Um, and all of those, the IRIS handbook, all of the methods that the EPA uses and the ATSDR uses, were all based on this initial um, guideline for toxicity assessment that was published in the Federal Register in 1987. And so it was a very high level kind of vague set of guidelines, but it outlined then what should be included in all of them and how these things should be taken into consideration. And then I think each agency has applied their own um, kind of set of procedures to them and are not, not so different, but they are for different purposes. So are there perspectives from others? I think, you know, part of the way that this will run is we'll share perspectives, we'll look for commonalities, we'll also be sure and highlight differences. At some point, we'll probably end up writing a document like we did to previous charge questions, the one that we did for PFMOAA, which we said, you know, well, on balance, we've said X, but if there's anything else that needs to be highlighted, we'll do that. But to be able to do that, we need to hear from more people in terms of like where you fall in this charge question and Franny, if you could put the charge question back up, I think since we've agreed on that, that'll be helpful. But the charge question, you know, is are the various assessments, the IRIS ones, the ones that followed the IRIS methods, but with, with an EPA and the ATSDR ones, which were relatively recent, are the various assessments adequate and of comparable quality to an IRIS assessment? Uh, so, uh, Anybody that we haven't heard from so far that wants to offer perspective on the charge question, that would be good content as we look for commonalities or differences. John? Um, John Mr. Manor. Jamie, I have more to add whenever uh, you put me in the queue. All right, you're next and John has the floor for now. Thank you though. So I think it would be helpful to say, are the non-IRIS EPA and CDC assessments adequate? Because I think that's the point here, right? The, the sort of, I'll call it the gold standard just for the purposes of Discussion here: The EPA's IRS assessments are viewed as identified in the state as the top tier, but there are EPA assessments that are not from the IRS program, such as the Office of Water ones here. And just by way of background, again, I haven't—I retired three years ago from EPA, but I was part of the IRS program. The reason that some of the assessments were done by the Office of Water instead of the IRS assessment was due to the extremely lengthy time for development of the IRS assessment to go through the extensive review process and development process. The Office of Water was very anxious to move forward more quickly. And there was an agreement to sort of parse it out as to which part of the organization, and there was also capacity level concerns too, which, which part of the agency would do what. And there was an agreement that there would be, again, I'm speaking as I understand it, that the Office of Water would follow essentially the same procedures in terms of development, systematic review, you know, using the same approaches that were used by the IRS assessment, but and go through peer review, but not the same really quite elaborate and extensive and difficult process that the IRIS assessments face. So in my view, they are both, the, the non-IRIS EPA values by the Office of Water are adequate and of comparable quality. That's just my bottom line, if you will. Um, second point, turning to the, to the ATSDR, the CDC ones, as you say here, um, I think it's important in the chart that you sent around, Franny, that as picking up on what Elena said, is that these are the intermediate MRLs. Yes for uh, ATSDR, not, they're, they're in some ways, they're not comparable to IRIS in terms of the time frame that's actually important here. But in terms of the quality, which is essentially part of the question here, are they comparable? They're, they're comparable quality, but only for those time frames that they actually match up. They don't match up exactly here. And that's yeah. kind of an underlying discrepancy here that may appear to be, well, they're really different. Well, they actually are for different time domains, which is an important consideration here. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And that's one of the things that the EPA discusses in that document they had was that, you know, they are initially designed to be an intermediate screening level. Um, and they use the, I can't remember which one is the developmental um, endpoint, but the one that was derived from a developmental endpoint, they extrapolated to using for their chronic reference dose because it's, a, it's such a sensitive lifetime point. 
and they didn't add any additional uncertainty factors. But the other one, since it was intermediate and it was in life, they did add the uncertainty factors for. So there's a lot there. I, I do think that the first part that you mentioned about rephrasing the charge question is like where I was at at the beginning. Are we clear on charge? And I guess I'd ask uh, Assistant Secretary Mace Moore and Franny, is that friendly amendment helpful to, to be able just to rephrase the charge question of are the non-IRIS assessments adequate and of comparable quality to the IRIS assessments so that we're clear on what it's being asked? Because it sounds like a couple of them, you know, that are IRIS already meet the bill and the ones that are IRIS-like are probably closer and the real focus is on the ones that would be a different method. But I think that's helpful in terms of moving forward, but I'm going to ask you all since you all are the ones who crafted the charge. I agree with that. I mean, that's really the intent to get your collective expertise and yeah, great. Well, then we'll capture that, John, thanks. And then the second parts then, you're saying that uh, they are of the ones, if I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you were saying that the ones that were um, done by Office of Water using the IRIS methods you think would be of comparable quality and adequate. The ATSDR ones might be of comparable quality, but the adequacy might be the fit for purpose part that... Uh, mm -hmm. Paraphrasing. Well, good. I'm glad you you were quite clear. Yeah. The the second part, though, I was going to ask just as follow up be, before you. So I would actually have it be the non iris EPA assessments and the CDC assessment. No, don't lump it together like that. Okay. There just to probe a little bit further um, in your summary, uh, we mentioned you know that EPA took the ATSDR um, as the foundation for uh, their use of that value in the primary drinking water proposal. Um, but then they, recognizing that disconnect for purpose, added another divide by 10 to go from intermediate to chronic. Would that change your judgment of adequacy or not? Not trying to put words in your mouth, but I think it's a little bit of a different question because they didn't stop. They didn't just pull that number in they use that number as a foundation then for one more safety factor and then apply this. So EPA 2023 is a different PFHXS reference dose than ATSDR by a factor of 10. And I would go with the EPA version of that because that's in line with the purpose and scope of the IRIS assessments, mm -hmm. whereas, as Elena very nicely said, the ATSDR assessments are actually for a different purpose, and the fact that it's an intermediate is, a, to me, a significant difference there. Mm -hmm. Now, if they had developed a chronic MRL, perhaps they would be right in line. I just don't know. And that may be, I don't know if we need to quibble anymore with the charge question, but you could say, you know, the, uh, the e they're, they're, at this point, they're all EPA RFDs that are proposed, they're just, two of them have a foundation of all of the data search, literature synthesis, peer review, uh, study examination coming from ATSDR, but EPA did add another factor of 10 on before they adopted it as their proposed reference does for those two compounds. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna go to Jamie first because she was in the queue and then Rich is gonna be next, but thank you, this is good. I think the more people that we hear from, the better in terms of looking for consensus statements or anything that uh, might be uh, a difference of opinion to explore further. So, Jamie, you have the floor, and then we're going to hear from Rich. Well, I think John's comments and, and your summary comments pretty much uh, took the words out of my mouth. I was just going to reaffirm that there is rigorous external peer review for the ATSDR uh, der derived MRLs, not, probably not quite as extensive as IRIS, but there is external peer review as well as internal peer review. So there is that process um, that was in some of Franny's uh, notes, but I just wanted to affirm that. And then just to confirm, because I'm looking at the documents now, that PFNA did not have that additional uncertainty factor because the health effect identified as critical was a developmental endpoint. And then PFHXS is the one that had that additional uncertainty factor placed in because the MRL was intermediate as opposed to chronic. But I, I agree with all of the discussion thus far. Thanks. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, when you say the document that you were looking at, are you talking about the ATSDR document or are you talking about the one that EPA used that adopted the ATSDR and then modified it just for clarity okay. with the notes? Yep, I'm, I'm talking about the March 2023 public review draft for the four uh, PFAS proposed for uh, regulation under the Safe Drinking Water Act. That would be for Gen X, PFBS, PFNA, and PFHXS. Great. Yeah. Um, and when you mentioned that all those documents have been under uh, peer review, the uh, ATSDR document itself, the 993 pages of it, when you download that, that's um, been through uh, three reviews, three public comment reviews, a March 20 update before a May 2021 final. So there's um, extensive peer review of that foundation as well and then additional peer review from EPA's adoption of that number and modification of it. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Rich. Yeah, thanks, Ray, really good. Uh, can you put back the uh, slide that shows the eight compounds and how they're broken out by who, uh, you know, what, what the assessments were based on? Yeah. I think I wanna get this clear. This one. Yeah, that one. So if I'm understanding it, and, and you guys know a lot more about this than I do, and certainly what John was saying was super helpful. So it sounds to me like the first two, one and two, are looking very promising. And so really the question is number three, right? I mean, so so that really would be the focus of, of, our, of our analysis. And so I guess then... You know, how do we go forward to really get, I mean, so it sounds to me, what I'm hearing is that, uh, yeah, number three is iffy. And is there, for example, any uh, thought that either the uh, Office of Water or IRIS will do an analysis of those two under number three to get at something more comparable to the other six? I believe it's PFHXS that is... Progress. on the yeah on the docket for the iris assessment but it it's i think still in step one it's not even close to being released to the public yet so so basically then there's there's a time crunch so so the state needs an answer before other analyses will come out is that fair Yes, if I mean, if we're trying, when we are trying to propose these um, as soon as the EPA makes the MCLs final. Um, I'm curious to see what the EPA does when that iris assessment is finalized and if they update their primary drinking water regulation or if, if they will not update it. Um, but but it's could, yet to be seen. I mean, just to be fair, you could separate out the question of time crunch and say, if you thought the answer to the charge question was that they were comparable and adequate, why not go now? I mean, if they're comparable and adequate, then it doesn't, you, you don't need another document. That's why I was probing John for uh, once EPA took that document and did the divide by 10 and adopted it kind of as their own in a draft. Did he think that was adequate? And I got a yes. Um, I hear you that if somebody else is going to turn the crank, you could wait for it. But if you think that the answer is inadequate, then you got to wait. But if you think the answer is adequate, then maybe you're good. Elena. I'd like to move back to um, another fundamental. What we're really looking at here, I think, is method comparability. And I think you have to acknowledge that even if even when the methods are comparable, at the end of the day, for some compounds, you're going to be relying on expert judgment. So that is another reason why the numbers can differ and not just not just the purpose that the number is going to be used for that can mean a difference but also scientific judgment does enter into this and that is going to be somewhat somewhat dynamic because the the literature particularly for the PFAS is constantly evolving good point um, John was pretty clear on the adequacy and the comparability 
do you have an opinion for the, if, as Rich summarized, if we're talking about just number three here with the um, ATSDR derived values as a foundation for EPA's next step on comparability at the method level, adequacy or comparability? It depends on the methods that were used, but the fact that the EPA apparently used the same studies and made some different value judgments based on their differing purpose, I would, that tell, that says a lot right there. Um, and again, my own perspective, looking at a methodologic standpoint, the, I, I see the ATSDR draft method that was published in 2018 and the IRIS handbook methods as being similar in regards to the criteria for systematic review, the uh, criteria for evaluating studies in terms of their adequacy. Yeah, that's helpful. I think that's what the um, adequate, the, the, simil, the comparability part of the charge question is definitely related to that. So that's super helpful. Can we go back to the charge question again for a second? Yeah, yeah sure. We should have started there. I don't know why we didn't. <laughs> Because I, I took you off. Um, right, that's okay. I'm teasing. Are we, are we speaking here in this discussion specifically to the PFAS and PFOA or more generally about all ATSDR assessments? I think that we're speaking specifically here to, and I think, then I think it's, we should it's say for that. the DEQ. We're speaking about the eight that DEQ is proposing to move to rulemaking. Okay. Then I think that would be important to say here is to keep it focused on what the discussion yeah, as is. As opposed to a generic discussion exactly, about methodology. Right. And, and part of the reason I say that is because on one of the other slides, uh, Franny, you showed the criteria for surface water and had iris and non-iris and mm -hmm. then anything else that was published in peer review to sound like. Yeah. So that's a pretty big lift right there because you've got Cal EPA, you've got uh, Texas, you've got California, you got Netherlands, you got a lot of other organizations that developed, fully developed organizational being peer reviewed by the government. That right there, number four on the right hand side. Yeah. Um, that's a big. That's a big world out there, and I don't think that we want to get into that right now. But perhaps at some point in the future, you might. But I think that's. Yeah. I don't want to be really clear. We're not talking about that right now. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a helpful clarification, as I understand this. You could say number four on the right or three on the left means yeah. that there's yeah. other reasonable ways to do this. Yeah. But you heard Franny refer to the iris as the gold standard. Yeah. And so they want to know how comparable to the gold standard do you have, which might, you know, um, inform the decision about which way to go. So that's think, a good point. I, I think for the state folks, you might think as to whether you want to engage in a discussion with us in the future about that to get some support as to how you think of how you think about what may be presented as consistent or competing assessments and how the decision, the thought process would work towards judging which one would be preferred by the state. We could do it one by one as we're kind of doing now, but it might be a more generic discussion as well to consider. Yeah. Yeah. So at least for groundwater, the, the references are listed in order of preference. And so number four is, is what we would use if there were none of the other three available. Um, and at least with some of the recent contaminants I've been looking at in other states, um, we've been deferring to the EPA because other states like California have very different rules right. and are, have, um, different authority in implementing their, their surface water and groundwater rules that North Carolina does than New York and Massachusetts. Like we all have very different, um, you know, varying arrays of, of authority. And so deferring back to the federal government is usually the most straightforward path. And that's why it's one, two, and three. Well, but I think in number four, you could have someone present to the state um, an assessment that was published in a journal yep. that has not been developed by um, a government organization, we'll say, whether state or federal or, or other international. And that would be a real question as to does number four include that? And it seems like your answer is yes, it does. It does, and that's yeah. something we're dealing with with that. Right. It seems like it could. It, it would. <laughs> it would put you know a burden on somebody to say that they were of comparable quality to the preferred sequence of events here. 
How about folks over here? I've been looking this way for a while. Uh, any perspective to offer on the charge question? If we could put it back up, it has two components that, uh, and as revised. So you're uh, going to add specific to these chemicals, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The adequacy, uh, the adequacy, and the comparable comparability of the of the uh, values that were done um, outside of the IRIS program. Some of which use the IRIS method. Some of which use the ATSDR method. Comparability and adequacy. This is good. Oh. That's better. So if we got clarity on the charge question, do y'all have a perspective to offer on it in terms of how you see it? Either sounds something that you heard so far that sounds about like what you, where you are or a differing perspective or say it your own way. Just curious. Well, I'll get back to the tables that uh, Franny put forward for us for PFOA and PFOS. Thank you very much, Franny. They're very helpful. And uh, in terms of comparability, one of the things that I noticed, and this may be an incorrect interpretation of these, but uh, the, the critical effects are different. The key studies are different. And this is a case where if uh, ATSDR updated their draft from 2018 to 2021, should be pretty much overlapping with what EPA has done in 2022. I, I thought the four-year difference would, might be enough to uh, allow for some differences, but that that's, may not be the case anymore. So I don't know how I could evaluate the comparability of these things or the quality of them in relationship to each other when the studies, the key studies, the critical effects are different. That's a major factor. The other that comes to mind is the duration of the study. ATSDR used intermediate MRL and uncertainty factors. That runs up intermediate MRL, as I understand it, runs from about two weeks up to one year. Is that correct? And their chronic MRLs go from 365 days, 366 days out to a lifetime. So if there is any comparability, it would have to be between lifetimes and lifetimes somehow. And the, the additional uncertainty factors might be appropriate for that. But even so, um, adjusting for that, adjusting for differences in currency of the data, uh, point of departures are orders of magnitude different. They really are. And I don't know where that's coming from. I don't understand it. Tom, this is Jamie. I have a comment in response when you have a moment, when you, when you can give me the floor. Okay. Okay. Well, so um, where I'm going with this, is, it, it, with quantitative differences this big, how do I judge quality, equality, or comparability? I mean, they're, they're like different planets that we're on. And uh, that's for PFO and PFOS, but we have a lot of information. So that's my two cents at this point. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, before we get to uh, a response to that, I'm just going to ask if anybody else has a perspective on the charge question, and then um, I'll circle back on that one. Uh, no, it's, excuse me, add offer. So I think the charge question is right, and it's good that it's specific. When I had consulted with our team, I think the concept of using a non iris based standard seems uh, um, reasonable. And I think as we get into the technicalities, especially, is it is it just the ASTD? ASTD? Thank you. Mm -hmm. The third category three, right? This is where we get into some of the, ni the, the nuance of the specific ones, but conceptually, um, this seems very reasonable and we're very supportive of, of pursuing <clears throat> what is reasonable and what is comparable. Thank you. Any other perspectives? Then Jamie, I'll circle back to you on the differences um, that Tom pointed out between, I guess it would be tab two in there, the PFO and the PFOS uh, toxicological reviews done by uh, EPA and ATSDR. 
and then I'll I have a comment on that too. But you're next. I was just gonna uh, just put, and this is something Tom Starr you pointed out. The ATSDR profile is from 2021, and the studies that they chose were part of the database that they considered when they put together the profile. The EPA was done at a later point in time for PFOA and PFOS, so they included additional studies. If you look back through all of the different health effects documents that the US EPA put together for PFOA and PFOS, at one point in time, there were similar studies used. For example, example the Lubker et al. study for PFOS that was used by ATSDR was one time, I believe, one of the critical effects for PFOS. It was either that or a Butanoff study that looked at a behavioral response uh, in developmentally exposed rodents. So, so there, there is congruency between the two values or points of departure if you look back through previous iterations of the EPA documents, but the EPA database has been updated. I mean, I, I can't predict if the ATSDR redid their profile today, if they would select the same critical effects for points of departure, but they would have an expanded database available to them to do that. The ATSDR also did uh, look at data to determine if they could derive a chronic MRL for PFOA and PFOS, and they they determined that at the time they did the assessment, there were no chronic exposure studies greater than or equal to 365 days in duration that they could use to satisfy that requirement for derivation of a chronic MRL. Uh, the US EPA, as you know, doesn't have to use a chronic study to derive a chronic reference dose because they can put in uncertainty factors to use subchronic data to derive a chronic reference dose. So if you really get down into the granularity of these two assessments, they're not really radically different if you consider what I, I just shared with you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I've been I was an external peer reviewer for the ATSDR document um, during its 2018 iteration, and I was an external reviewer for the EPA health effects documents for PFOA and PFOS for the 2014 iteration. Thank you. That's helpful perspective um, to the question. I was just going to ask, you know, for point of reference, uh, DEQ isn't really asking us about PFO and PFOS uh, iris-like versus ATSDR, I don't think, but I'm just gonna check. And I think that's because, you know, they had their order of preference that if you have an iris or an iris-like value, that would be the preference over borrowing one from someplace else. So I don't know that we need to draw too much attention to that tab, but that's a little bit of an assumption on my part. Um, are we being asked to help differentiate to differentiate in tab two between the use of those values? Uh, because there would be a lot that would go into that in addition to what Jamie mentioned about, you know, one being newer than another one. But is DEQ uh, using the iris values in that tab two moving forward? Yeah, so the EPA values are the ones that we're using. And I think it's also important to note that when the um, ATSDR assessment came out, the final version in May of 2021, the rating value from the EPA was still 70 PPT for PFOS and PFOA. They hadn't updated any of their reference doses at that point. So the IRIS or the ATSDR assessment was a series of lower values until the EPA updated those values again and made them orders of magnitude lower. And so this has been, you know, a, a stepping stone of a process to the values that EPA has now. Um, and I think that when we talked about this um, in December, um, the idea of comparing the results of PFAS and PFOA from the two different types of assessments would be a good way to compare them. And when I did that, I realized that was not that helpful because ATSDR derives those numbers for a different reason. And the EPA assessment is not only newer, but it's derived for a very different purpose, for a lifetime exposure. And so when I made that um, comparison table, I realized that wasn't going to be sufficient for this discussion. And so I made that much larger table and then also compared the, um, the three methods on the final tab um, because I figured that would help facilitate 
what we're after a little more effectively than just the final values because we can you know weigh in on on the derivation of those values but the EPA is not going to change what they've done based on our discussion and so we're just looking to see if um, those assessments are all of comparable quality yeah and importantly of the comparable quality and approach is that if the EPA numbers have gone through uh, a rigorous data call data sieve data extraction data synthesis and then peer review and response um, that's that's what I think you know your methodological question was about are they a good launching point for for rulemaking as opposed to having to start from whole cloth locally yeah so good thanks for answering that I think that's helpful in terms of it, it may make the charge question even a little bit more clear uh, relative to the to the table that we received John uh, so this may affect the charge question again could you go back to the eight that you showed in terms of the OW and IRIS and the ATSDR slide again. So I just want to be clear. Um, point three here, ATSDR did an assessment, then EPA reviewed that assessment mm -hmm. and made some choices about how to apply it to be more consistent with an IRIS assessment is what I'm going to say. So, so if we go back to the charge question now, are we referring to the original ATSDR assessment or to EPA's subsequent evaluation of that charge question, or that, that assessment. I think that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Because it doesn't yeah. say that there. That is what we're talking about. And so, so I it think should it's say the, CDC's ATSR assessment subsequently reviewed by EPA. Yeah, I think the, that was the point that I was trying to make early on when I was given that EPA reference is that, you know, in a sense, EPA, all of these are EPA reference doses right. at this point. At this it's point. just they had different launching points. So I think it's good to say that, be really clear. Yeah. So my answer is yes. <laughs> uh, Elena, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, this is, this is in the way of a comment. Um, I'd like us to be mindful and careful of our terminology. An MCL is under the Safe Drinking Water Act is a legally enforceable limit. So it calls, it brings into play things like uh, technical and economic feasibility. They're, they're an MCLG or maximum contaminant level goal also under the Safe Drinking Water Act, or rather, yeah, Safe Drinking Water Act is just that. It is the health-based part of this. And so I had a clarification question. For any, when you say, does the state call their legally enforceable limit an MCL? For our drinking water values, um, the federal MCLs are promulgated yeah. to our drinking water programs. For the PFAS we're proposing, they're being proposed for surface water and groundwater. And so the MCLs can be used um, but a health-based reference dose in the calculation is usually what is done. Okay, and that's because you do di use different exposure factors yes. in different, like, you know, and when I say exposure factors, I mean, like, drinking water, how much water you drink, and the relative source contribution and things like that. Yeah, and then um, the surface water also includes a, a fish consumption um, concentration and bioaccumulation factor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, these are being uh, launched for purpose in groundwater and surface water standards, which will be enforceable for those media. And then uh, the state can adopt EPA's drinking water rules when those are final, which would be different media. Yes, and a different set of rules as well. Like the, um, the permits and all of this for surface water are very separate from our drinking water utilities and, and things like that. So with the big picture in mind of uh, DEQ asking for a consultation on the adequacy of the comparability, comparability and adequacy of the methods, um, they're the ones that are considering developing these rules and moving them through rulemaking to the Environmental Management Commission and the public. They'll have an opportunity for comment. In terms of advising them and responding to the charge question, is there anything else that you think uh, needs to be stated for the record so that we remember to include it in any written summary we provide? Are we missing anything? <clears throat> I 
anything that was in your notes or in your head that you think is helpful granularity? Um, because we do have a lot of raw material here to mine for a summary statement, I think, which seems to be pretty close. Then uh, hearing none, I'll draw your attention to the spreadsheet that Franny made. Let's look at that first tab, because my sense is that um, in responding to the charge question, we'll probably reference the material that we were provided for review and see if anybody has any questions about that or anything that they, um, yeah, questions or any areas of disagreement with that first tab, because I think that's the... Just put that up. Yeah, that's the that's that's going to be in part uh, what frames the scale of the charge question you know, that we looked at, not just at these compounds, but the methods associated with these compounds, as opposed to the actual values that came out of these. And so the table is what compares the different steps of the methodology for IRIS in terms of what literature was searched, uh, what databases were searched, uh, what data quality objectives were used. I can see us referencing that, so it would be good to see if we have any questions about it. I'm just trying to fit it all on the screen before I show it to you. Because again, the tab three is the methods in general, but because the methods are evolving, they didn't, ATSDR didn't just follow their old guidelines, they modified them. Um, so maybe that's not gonna be helpful on the screen of this size, but y'all have seen it before. Um, that was the spreadsheet that was sent out on March 17th and then again last week. Uh, as, a, as something that we would refer to potentially in the response to the charge, is there anything here that you think is missing? I do think it's pretty well done in terms of, and this was, Dr. Starr's recommendation back in December when this question was initially posed, that if you want to know about adequacy of methods, break down the methods into their component part. Everybody starts with a literature search. Were they similar or not? Everybody has some data quality objectives. Were they similar or not? People have to pull out the relevant toxicological studies. Is that being done by a team or an individual? Uh, do, they, do they have peer review or not? So I do think that the table helps us respond to the charge, or at least I found it helpful. But are there any comments on the table? This is Jamie. I, I thought the table was very helpful and it could even be turned into a manuscript, such as the one that was shared with us earlier. <laughs> uh, for a complete mistake, while folks are looking at the table to see if you have anything else, I'll just share that uh, I asked Detlef, since we knew all the way back in December that he was going to be at a conference in Yale, at Yale to... Um, give me his feedback. And he said, I found the paper that Elena sent very helpful. Based on the paper, it appears that the various assessments are of comparable quality to that of an IRIS assessment. And then in terms of adequacy, I would say it depends on which studies were included available at the time the assessment was conducted and whether the included studies contain sufficient information to determine reference doses, MRLs that are health protective. So he says yes to comparable and it depends on uh, adequacy in terms of the question being asked. Anything else on table, on the table? Yeah, John? I mean, generally, uh, I think it's the, the advantage of having the IRIS handbook is it's very explicit. Mm -hmm. about the different steps that you see in columns. Well, all the columns except for, I guess, J and K, which are the ATSDR columns. That's correct. 
So you're getting a little bit of vagueness there about that, but I think that's because perhaps, as Elena pointed out, they haven't finished their guidelines for the SOP yeah. yet, I guess, as far as I know. So, you know, it's hard to do exactly are they comparable because clearly, for just example, study quality there, it's, it's very explicit how that's done with the IRS assessment. It's not so clear exactly what it means by the properties of body evidence were considered our risk of bias. You know, well, they consider all those things. Mm -hmm. How they do it is a little bit murky. <laughs> and that, um, there's a 2018, that's the 2018 uh, guidance document that ATSDR that published in draft in 2018 for their methods. And that's that's the thing to consult to see how similar or different they are. It's a relatively large document, and I haven't had time to digest it, but perhaps uh, looking at that. And then the other companion question would be, of course, is did they use those draft methods when they were developing those assessments? Um, but again, that harkens back to EPA started from their assessment as it used it as a springboard, if you will. So that, again, as, as others have said, that tells you something. And the other question is, you know, again, were those, were those guidelines followed? Mm -hmm. uh, because I think the guidelines are similar in some respects, mm -hmm. um, again, for systematic review, but you really have to get into the weeds of them to be sure. Yeah, and the weeds are available. Uh, and maybe this is a helpful thing to add in the table or in our response to the charge. The EPA document that borrowed from the ATSDR our, our document probably should be cited here in the table as, you know, the way that we clarified the charge question. It's not the ATSDR document. It's the EPA document which borrowed from it. That should be cited here. And the 993-page ATSDR document is available and online to download. That's the one that... Jamie said she was a peer reviewer on in 2018. Now there's a July 2021 version. If you just search PFX, PFHXS in that, you can go down and you can see what literature they picked, what studies they picked, yeah. how they examined the epidemiology, how they examined the animal studies for every single endpoint and what decisions they made. So you could do that deep dive and say, did they follow their method? as part of following their methods, that's available. And maybe we can just, you know, uh, across the top, cite the primary sources for these documents because that link could be helpful to somebody that wants to do the deeper dive. Yeah, and and just there's a distinction between the methodology document, for example, an IRIS handbook or that draft 2018 MRL methodology document versus the actual assessment. And you'd have to compare, you'd have to look, if you want to know, are they comparable? It's are the methods comparable, and then were those methods followed when they did the assessment? And I'm not saying they are, or they aren't. I'm saying that's that's the the way you have to think about it yeah. to get to you know these specific chemicals. Because again, um, there are lots of assessments out there by lots of different groups with using different methodologies, and the methodologies have changed over time. But they but very often I know before the the IRIS handbook was finalized, uh, EPA was using those methods of systematic re review because, again, that's part of test driving the methodology, if you will, to, in sh to uh, figure out any places where you need to refine it and before you finalize it. Yeah. Yeah, we had said that there's a, a variety of levels at which you can answer the question. Tab three is comparability of methods. Tab one is comparability of the methods as applies to these compounds. And then there's the, do you want to use the table for the evaluation or do you want to dig into each document and do an independent evaluation? Could you pull up the charge question? I think that we can use that to take us home on this topic for a path forward. Yep. Well, she pulls that out, I just like to make a point that I'm not being critical of ATSGR and, and you're summary of that. In contrast, I'd say this is a huge advance over where we were 10 years ago. I mean, it's just incredible how much more documentation of methods has been developed in the last 10 years, both by EPA and ATS and other organizations. It's just, it's a changed world, and it's in partly a reflection of criticism of lack of clarity. 
So mm -hmm. it's much more clear than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, oh, good point. I also found it interesting how fast these can change uh, for compounds like PFAS, new studies for which are being published um, all the time. So charge question regarding the eight PFAS that DEQ is proposing for rulemaking are the non-IRIS EPA assessments uh, and EPA's review of the CDT, CDC, ATSDR assessments adequate and of comparable quality to the EPA IRIS assessments. I do think that is the charge question that we received, but now clearer in terms of parsing it out. Uh, no need to consider the two that are IRIS and then the ones that explicitly followed IRIS sound extremely similar. Uh, with that clarity on the charge question and the discussion, do folks feel like uh, there's a motion to be made in terms of uh, bringing it home? Um, because the question could, the charge question could be rephrased as a, as a finding. We don't have to do that now. Um, there's going to be a summary document, but if, if uh, folks thought it could be um, charge rephrased into statement, that could be one, one path forward. Tom? This may be just a little nitpicking, but the second part of what's outlined in blue is the EPA's review of the CDC ATSDR assessments. And that's EPA's review is the subject of the adequate and of comparable quality to EPA's IRIS assessments. So are we, are we commenting on the quality and uh, adequacy of EPA's review or of I don't know. See, or maybe see. it's, so I, I get your point. Maybe it's uh, EPA's, EPA's reference dose founded on CDC ATSDR. Yeah, maybe that. Can you yeah. capture that for us, Franny, and replace review with uh, EPA's reference dose um, based on? Because it did, it did uh, include an evaluation and it did include another safety factor, yeah. And this is also might be a little bit... <laughs> Nuance, but and and I was struck when we brought this up. Is quality really the right word? Because what I'm hearing is like, are the methods adequate, <clears throat> and did they follow those methods consistently? Like, I'm not quite sure I know what to do with the word quality. We really want to know, like, are those methods appropriate? Um, are the assessment methods appropriate and adequate? And then, did they follow? Them. That I'm just still because it seems, and also in the the last question, <clears throat> it may not be the comparable quality. Maybe we think the assessment wasn't adequate. I feel like we at least need to add the adequate. And sure. I'm just struggling a little bit on the word quality. And maybe I'm wordsmithing too much. But it's hard to know what quality yeah. is. Really, is yeah. it reasonable? You know, were those methods reasonable? Did they follow those methods? Did the you know was the information they, they chose um, um, reasonable and appropriate? You know, quality is just a little bit of a swishy word. Elena? Um, perhaps replace quality with fit for purpose mm -hmm. and purpose being the purpose of the purposes of the state for rulemaking. Mm -hmm. Groundwater and surface water standards development. Because again, it's a different kind of a question based on the use case. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Is that, we're stomping all over your charge question. Is, is, are those, uh, I'll pause for a second just to ask uh, DEQ that brought the charge to us. These feel to me like, like helpful both in terms of clarity and also specificity. But is that how they feel to you in terms of uh, are we making progress for you? Got a thumbs up from Assistant Secretary. I agree. Okay. I kind of expected uh, this to be um, an iterative uh, process with everyone. To put in front of the word rulemaking, groundwater, surface water, or whatever you think is appropriate. And I do think in a, water quality, yeah. in a write-up of... Uh, what we have found, we can capture some things like Dr. Tilson just mentioned in terms of well, what's fit for purpose mean. Uh, there's the quality, there's adequacy, there's uh, the um, robustness. I thought that there's several words in there that we might discuss. 
so just to bring it home again, uh, there does seem to be, uh, I don't know if consensus is the right word, but I haven't heard too many diverging opinions. Um, does anybody see a charge answer by rephrasing that charge question? Yes. What would it sound like, Tom? Uh, yes. <laughs> so it could be that. Uh, what about the SAB fines, comma, regarding blah, blah, blah? <laughs> so say it again, John. If you just had started by saying the SAB, the SAB fines, comma, regarding the eight, that could be a finding. Do we yeah. agree with that finding? How would folks feel about that? Does DEQ have a an opinion on this on the on the uh, yes or no? Is that helpful? <laughs> this is Sushma Mason again. You know, it's just amazing listening to the last hour of uh, just productive and and engaging and very thoughtful conversation around a very basic request you know from our practical perspective what we what we're trying to do here is um, potentially preempt any questioning and any concerns that could be raised this may not be an issue but because our rules are so prescriptive there is flexibility in the groundwater rules right but the surface water rules are very prescriptive and we're working to allow this change in what you talked about, Dr. Vinberger, that EPA itself, the federal agencies are overwhelmed by the need for scientific data and that they're having to come up with alternative mechanisms outside of these five, six year studies. And so in that changing world, we have not yet caught up with our rules. And so any actions we take in between, we need to come back to experts like you all to weigh in on, is this good enough? Can we hang our hat on it? And what I'm hearing is there are differences, but at the, at the end of the day, um, for fit for purpose, you know, for the purpose of establishing life, lifetime um, um, water, water quality standards, that you your basis of the scientific data is going to derive through the same mechanism, same procedures, and you're going to end up with the similar results. So that's helpful, and I think we can convey that. And um, this group's thoughts and, 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 you know, conclusions are going to be powerful in the event that we get questioned. Uh, again, I don't know that we need to have a, a formal vote on it, but it might be a nice bow to put on the discussion if somebody wants to make that charge question that's been made into a statement as a motion. <laughs> Randy, you could change the R after the first blue uh, text to that. NCSSAB finds blah, 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 that. The... That, yes. And then after the second uh, blue, blue text, R, adequate and of comparable fit for purpose to the EPA's mm -hmm. iris assessments. Yeah, that's it. We can draw it to a close with that something for people to think about, or if somebody feels strongly that there's enough agreement to make that as a motion and have a vote that either passes or fails, that could be instructive as well, just in terms of seeing how close we are. So, John Vanberg, I would move that we accept that charge <clears throat> response now as stated on the screen. I don't know, Jamie, does Jamie see this or not? Jamie, can you see what we're reading? Yes, I can. Okay. And so far, I agree. Okay, so I would move that we accept that response. I'm not sure I'm saying that well, but yeah. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second. So we have a, a, a proposal on the floor and a second. 
that the narrative captured on the screen here uh, is an adequate reflection of the board's uh, discussion and conclusions. Um, that will be turned into a document that you all will see to capture the flavor of the discussions uh, such that DEQ has more than just the recording. But I do think it would be helpful to go ahead and take a vote on that in terms of whether or not um, it's a consensus opinion or whether there's any disparate ones. So that's the motion on the floor that seconded. Is there any discussion about it before we vote? I'll pause for a second. Then I'll ask uh, all in favor of supporting that motion, uh, aye. Aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Thank you, Jamie. Anyone opposed? And anyone abstaining? All right, well, we'll make sure that we capture the result of the discussion, including the uh, response to the charge question in a draft that I'll circulate by um, all of you with the staff's help so that you can make sure that the granularity of your input is adequately captured as well. And I think like we did for PFMOAA, we can also put the link to discussion in there if somebody wants to hear you know, any of the back and forth as well. Um, uh, I'll let the agency have the last word before we break for lunch, as well as uh, make sure if there's any questions from the board since before we leave for lunch, since some people have to leave at lunch. Anything else from the department on this topic? No, this was great. Thank you. You're welcome. And any feedback from the board on anything related to the board? It's been a while since we've seen each other. I really appreciate you all being here. Well, my other thought just in reference to this is, um, and Franny, you had mentioned that one of the PFAS is that's under the um, ATFDR <laughs> is being reviewed under IRIS, that it still feels like we would have kind of priority of preference of standards, right? So right now, I think we say, if, if this is what we have, this is adequate, but that we might have, if <clears throat> there's a change when Iris is looking, uh, I can't remember which one it was, but that maybe in there a language that we would have a kind of priority and that say, if there is an Iris standard, then go with that, if you yeah. have that Some, somewhere in there, that prioritization, mm -hmm. as because this will be evolving, so we don't want to, get stuck into here. We want to be sure that it's evolving with the evidence and making that kind of priority clear, same way we have in the in the rule and statute. Yeah, and that's yeah. a normal process that yeah. our um, standards and planning group goes under um, a triennial review. And so every three years, um, a group of standards is reviewed for new and updated toxicological information and are updated appropriately. Okay. And so when that comes out um, and these are promulgated, they would be put into like the next batch of, of larger standards review um, and just be part of that process going forward. Great. Any other general comments? Well, then we'll break for lunch until one o'clock. If uh, Peter could put a note into the chat for anybody joining online that uh, we are on break until one. I know we are saying goodbye to Tom at one. So thanks very much for your participation, preparation as always, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll be back in here at one. And at one is um, agency updates on PFAS rulemaking, on 1,4 dioxane, uh, other topics, as well as the public forum in case anybody has signed up. Franny, you did a great job supporting our discussion here. So thank oh, you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's across the hall. Okay. At least I think. I don't know. I'm assuming. I was so hungry. I was. I'm going to try to make sure that's here. From uh, DEQ on the status of PU Pass rulemaking. And I don't know who's giving that. Uh, so I'll just say. Um, we're ready to hear from DEQ on the status of PFAS rulemaking.
So we're going to hear from Stephanie Bolliard um, on our rulemaking status. I'm not sure why this is uh, showing picture in picture on the front slide. Yeah, great. And I'll remind people that in the December meeting, um, notes online there's also an update on the status of rulemaking i reviewed that as background material for this one and summarized some of that earlier so thanks for joining us stephanie thank you for having me um of so today i'll be uh, giving an update on the dqp fast rulemaking activities along with uh, my colleague jessica monti who will be giving an update on 2l the groundwater i'll be giving an update on 2b so today's presentation, we're gonna give you a high level, very brief overview of our purpose and guiding principles for our rulemaking process, uh, PFAS of supporting toxicological assessments, which I believe you've heard already about, and then both the surface water and groundwater quality PFAS rulemaking processes. This will be high level. We have given multiple more in-depth presentations to EMC. We can direct you to that if you'd like to see those presentations, and of course, we'll be available for questions after. Okay, so our guiding principles here is, of course, protecting drinking water sources. Um, also, through surface water quality uh, standards, we can also potentially reduce treatment burdens for upstream dischargers, like POTWs and industrial users. Uh, proposing surface water and groundwater quality standards for PFAS that are a part of the national MCLs. And then also proposing additional standards for those PFAS that do have um, tox adequate toxicity and human health data that is published. We also are um, spending a lot of time making sure that we provide transparency to our various regulated sources. And also keeping in mind allowing adequate time for monitoring and taking actions to meet effluent limits if a facility is deemed to need one. So we wanna briefly go over the EPA proposed drinking water standards because they are a foundation and very important aspects of our rulemaking process. Um, these are expected to be finalized this month. It is anticipated the compliance requirements would be effective as early as 2027. And then the compounds that have proposed MCLs and MCLGs are listed here. For context of North Carolina, our public water systems do supply drinking water to over 9 million North Carolinians. There are 459 public water supplies that do receive their source water from surface water bodies, hence surface water quality limits are very important here. And then currently based on the data that we have available, 41% of those large systems, which means they serve over 10,000 people, do currently exceed one of the proposed EPA standards. So proposing these water quality standards, we anticipate will reduce PFAS and surface water discharge and reduce cleanup requirements and costs for public water supply systems. And then compliance with EPA's drinking water standards that are under state authority. So I know we've all seen this um, in your SAB meetings. These are, of course, the PFAS that are under the roadmap and then non-EPA PFAS roadmap compounds. These we would commonly see occurring in North Carolina. These following eight compounds are the ones that have um, proposed North Carolina surface water and groundwater standards. So specifically related to surface water standards. As, a, um, as we illustrated and mentioned before, one of the motivations here is the connection between implementing surface water standards that then could translate to upstream effluent limits that in hopes would reduce any further impacts to downstream drinking water treatment plants from those either industrial or uh, publicly owned treatment work sources. So how standards are derived. You've heard a lot about um, information from Dr. Franny Nielsen. We are proposing numeric standards based on our O2B, O28 rules. They are developed in per the translation procedure and calculations that are set in that rule. Numeric criteria are derived for both fish consumption and water supplies at designated uses. And we do consider carcinogenic and non-carcinogenic endpoints. The values, the toxicological values that we do use for standard calculations are reference dose, K2, 
cancer slope or potency factor, and also the bioaccumulation factor, which noting here is for surface water standards only. Using that information and the translation process in our rules, these are the standards that are proposed to be added under O2B200 um, for those eight PFAS compounds. Uh, the first column you'll see after the PFAS constituents is for non-surface water, non-water supply standards. So those would be class C. Uh, second column are water supply. And then one thing to note here is we also listed the EPA limit of quantification, which was from those proposed N, uh, MCL documentation. Um, we do have two PFAS that have surface water standards below the current limit of quantification for PFAS. I do want to note here that these are water supply standards. This does not mean that this is going to directly translate to effluent limits for that facility. There is a process that is set in our rules to actually set those, those limits. So how are the proposed standard used to determine what the impact is on our regulated programs? Um, part of our statutory requirements do outline um, doing a fiscal note to look at the impacts on various stakeholders uh, in terms of those limits. So in this process, we've looked at identifying the potential affected sources, permittee, and permit program types, developed an implementation plan that I will go over further, but that's something as in the lines of monitoring and how a standard would be rolled out if approved. We then use that implementation plan to determine what the fiscal impacts would be on the regulated entities that we expect to be impacted. And then lastly, with that information, we would conduct or are concurrently conducting a comprehensive cost benefit analysis. This is a brief overview of our current implementation schedule. Uh, the first two years, 2024 to 2025, do propose implementing assessment monitoring. That is through permit conditions for any permits that are currently under renewal or through 0500 letters. Uh, once the 1633 drink, um, PFAS method is approved and promulgated in the CFR, we anticipate at the end of 2025, that monitoring that would be completed at a facility would shift over to certified monitoring. At that point, the data that's collected would be able to be used to develop effluent limits as long as there's enough data points to perform a reasonable potential analysis. At that point, if a facility is deemed to need an effluent limit, they would get a permit with limits, but also most importantly, a compliance schedule that'll help that facility comply with that effluent limit within a certain time frame. Using that information, we are going to conduct a cost benefit analysis where on the cost side, really focusing on the cost associated with the proposed PFAS regulatory changes. We are specifically looking at both private sector, local government and state government impacts. On the benefit side, we are looking at what the benefits are for the proposed regulatory alternatives relative to a baseline, including the quantification and monetization of those benefits. So there are going to be human health benefits that we can quantify, but there are also going to be other human health ecosystems and economic benefits that we might only be able to qualitatively discuss in our fiscal note. And then also looking at uh, potential reductions in public water supply treatment cost savings by reducing discharges upstream of those facilities. The treatment cost components we are doing a cost analysis that is looking at both the capital expenditures of the required treatment, what the continued operation and maintenance might be. And in the case that we need to look at repair and replacement costs, um, that will be determined as a percentage of the initial capital expenditure for that facility. One of the ways that we're looking at treatment costs is by doing a comprehensive treatment evaluation. I do want to note that we're focusing on shelf-ready technologies, nothing that's emerging that's not at scale that cannot be implemented tomorrow if needed. Those technologies are granule-activated carbon and ion exchange that's absorbing PFAS to media. Uh, the residual related to that would be media that would need to be disposed of. And then also looking at reverse osmosis, which is a filtration-type process that would generate a concentrated liquid that would need to be disposed of. One thing to note here in the potential affected sources, we do need to understand the effectiveness of treatment by sector type. 
Um, and this information we've been working with two national consultants to help us vet that technology and provide that technical uh, expertise and guidance. I'm not gonna read these, but these are an overview of the benefit categories that based on the available information today, we could quantify the human health benefits that we can only qualify. And then looking at the environmental and social economic benefits that'll be quantitative qualitative that we can look at connecting in our fiscal note, and then looking at quantifying the savings to uh, downwater drinking water utilities. So overall, we are currently taking into consideration results from various stakeholder meetings that we had that provided input that would allow us to make changes to our implementation strategy where applicable we are completing the analysis of the anticipated cost to POTWs with pretreatment programs, including those significant industrial users and industrial dischargers. In the coming weeks, we'll be working on our benefits analysis, and then we anticipate having a certified fiscal note to the EMC Water Quality Committee for their July meeting. Do we want to do questions now or just wait until 2L? I think we can wait until after 2L and um, okay. revisit it then. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Monti. I'm with the Division of Waste Management. I'll be um, speaking on the proposed groundwater standards and the rulemaking. Um, one important difference between the 2B standards and the 2L standards is that there is already existing requirements um, for the standards for uh, any non-naturally occurring substance in groundwater. Um, the uh, effective standard is the PQL, the practical quantitation limit. So if it's detected and it's not naturally occurring, that's considered an exceedance of groundwater. And that is in the existing rules in um, 15A NCA co 2 l Rule 0202C. Uh, another existing rule requirement that I wanted to point out because it's applicable um, later in the slides is that where you have a standard uh, for a substance that's less than the PQL, the detection of that substance at or above the PQL constitutes a violation of the standard, meaning if you have a standard set below the PQL, we would still use the PQL as the effective standard in that case. So this is the um, rule requirement for developing groundwater quality standards in the existing rule. So we would establish the groundwater standard as the least of these options, um, the first two being the, the non-cancer threshold and the concentration that corresponds to incremental lifetime cancer risk, or the taste threshold, odor threshold, maximum contaminant level, and the secondary drinking water standard. So we would be choosing the least of those and the first two, uh, this is how the um, Division of Water Resources staff calculates those two values. And this is information I think that Franny also presented earlier. Um, the following references are used in order of preference. So the first three being the EPA or other relevant standards, which I believe you all discussed earlier. These are the draft uh, groundwater quality standards that are proposed in the rulemaking. We've presented these to stakeholders and shown them to the Environmental Management Commission. So um, they're for the eight PFAS for which we're proposing standards, but of course they're not final. And we also included the, as um, Stephanie did with the surface water standards, we also included the EPA's PQL that they're uh, included in their publication. Because if these standards, the proposed standards, are not adopted by the EMC, then we would continue to have the PQL be the standard for those constituents. So that's on the right is the value. That would be the effective standard if the proposed standards are not adopted. Um, and just to give an overview of um, the DEQ programs that implement or enforce the groundwater quality standards, the Division of Waste Management um, uses it as a compliance trigger or as the cleanup goal for remediation. There are other remediation options, such as risk-based uh, remediation, but the hazardous waste facilities, solid waste landfills, Superfund contaminated sites, and then underground storage tanks, um, the soil remediation um, sites 
especially would be the ones that might have the, the PFAS that they would have to apply, PFAS standards. Um, Brownfields section also uses them when reviewing the uh, Brownfields agreement applications. And then the Division of Water Resources also uses them for permitting the non-discharge program, which is a small number of, just a small number of facilities. So that is all I have. That was real quick. A lot of what um, Stephanie was saying about the methodologies, methodologies that we're using to calculate the costs would also be the same for the 2L fiscal note, with the difference being that we're going to, because there's already the existing standard of the PQL, we would be comparing what the cost would be under the existing standard versus what it would be under the proposed standards, which hopefully would give, because a lot of those standards are higher than the PQL, give regulatory relief for the regulated facilities that are under the DWM purview. So any questions? Thank you, Jessica and Stephanie for the update. I was just writing some notes as you were talking that uh, I think it was 2021 that we started talking about the different ways that PFAS could be addressed, whether individually or grouped. And then in a back and forth with the board and uh, the department started to make the spreadsheet of the compounds that were most frequently detected in North Carolina with columns for, you know, what which of those had available data if the state wanted to move on separately to the PFAS roadmap and the state action strategy. So it's been a, uh, an interesting evolution. We appreciate the update on it today for the next steps. Are there questions from anybody on the board in the room or online? Oh, I have a question. Yeah, John. It's probably a question for Stephanie. Um, just from our information, in the cost benefit analysis, what is the purpose of that? Is that actually used to inform the process in some fashion in terms of decisions or implementation or requirements? What, what, is, what is the point of the cost benefit analysis? I'll let uh, Shishma provide insight on that. Um, that's really a good question. Um, and I'll try to answer it to the best that I can. In our surface water standards are health-based standards. And so when there is a toxic pollutant found in surface waters of toxic concentration, then we as a state have the authority under the Clean Water Act to uh, require reduction of those concentrations to provide uh, adequate health margin for this for the users. The um, the finance for the fiscal analysis process is an APA process, the, uh, the Administrative Procedures Act requirements uh, that requires the EMC as a body to evaluate whether the levels at which those standards are set are achieving a balance with the cost of compliance and technologies that are available. So this is an interesting dichotomy where we have a health-based standard, but then the implementation um, is, is based on what is considered safe levels under the Clean Water Act. And whether or not the cost of uh, complying with those standards exceeds a reasonable amount um, when you account for the cost of the systems versus the benefits to human health and the ecosystem and so on. And so what the net is, is what the EMC will have to evaluate. And if it's positive or negative, uh, or the magnitude of it as a, as a regulatory um, decision makers, policy makers, they will have to examine um, what is in the best interest of the state. Um, it's, it's an area that we've, we've had very little, uh, at least in terms of rulemaking and fiscal analysis precedence. Um, but really, I think, I think it would be a useful information, but also transparency in terms of um, when we don't apply what we call the narrative standard, which we have the authority to implement in a rule, when we go through this, this open process and evaluate the impact of such a regulation, what does it mean to the end user as well as the impacted regulated community? So I hope I answered your question, but you did, but you obviously see the issue is that there are non quantifiable benefits. That's right. And, and so if you look at EPA's uh, drinking water standards, their, their regulatory impact analysis, RIA, they put significant emphasis on those non quantifiable benefits. And I believe in the, in the um, preamble, uh, the administrator, um, voices um, the, um, the policy implications of these non-quantifiable 
benefits. Uh, and it, at some point, somebody has to make those decisions. And I think in, in PFAS, uh, it is part of that decision making. Yeah. I had just one more question. It's not a science one, but in reading the uh, uh, Federal Register notice for EPA's proposed drinking water regulations, they did a fiscal analysis. Um, is that anything that y'all can borrow from? Or do you have to do yours from whole cloth? I just asked because, you know, we're borrowing from the reference doses that EPA spent all that time and energy developing. And if they had a robust process for their economic analysis, maybe there's something there that could be harvested as well. Um, I think we might have some differing, differing opinions on EPA's fiscal analysis. I think they have gone back and updated that. Um, our fiscal analysis is going to be a bit more comprehensive. I got you. Uh, be more realistic in terms of not just looking at the unit process and so forth. We have had our consultants compare the two. Ours are going to be a bit higher. But going back to that question of what's in the fiscal note, we certainly are leaning heavily on the benefits analysis as our starting point and hoping to expand upon that. So the slide that we had of the benefit categories on both the qualitative and quantitative aspects for the human health was based off of that, that report. Great. And I think the cost will be a little different too since they're costing drinking water impacts and we're talking about surface and groundwater impacts too. Yeah, I, ideally we're looking at the same treatment processes, but when it comes down to the change out of frequency of the media that's used to absorb PFAS or if someone elects to use RO backwash and everything like that is going to be uh, a lot different. All right. I think Shishma has. <laughs> you know, you're a scientific bud, so I'll, I'll give you one, one tidbit. When you look at the scale of the impact of this rulemaking relative to what we've done as a department, as a, even as a single division or two, um, the potential impact, the number of sources that could be affected, and the um, investment needed to comply with PFAS regulations is in, in a high level, a high magnitude. This is a This is going to be very impactful for the public, but also very concerning. Um, as a state, because we would be one of very few states to do this. It creates a economic potential. Someone could see it as an economic disadvantage for having regulations when other states don't. Um, it could also mean um, potential impacts to ratepayers, uh, because these are drinking water systems and wastewater, wastewater systems and perhaps even industrial applications. So it needs to be thought through, and our goal is to not just look at it from a, from regulations and from, from the standards point of view, but also provide the data necessary for decision makers to look at the holistic uh, impact of, of this action. So, so are you also looking at the collateral or co-benefits of the control technology for other chemicals than PFAS, PFOA? In other words, there's other chemicals that may be important in, in the milieu of things that we're all exposed to through our water systems that also would be affected and reduced by the application of these technologies. Are you considering those co-benefits? I think Stephanie can answer that question. The, by reducing the concentration of PFOA and PFAS, we will have co-benefits other PFAS in it. And Stephanie knows much more about the capacity, capability of these technologies. Yeah. Um, I our eight PFAS are either short chain or long chains. There are going to be some differences when we think about media in terms of removal of those. The treatments that are recommended for a facility are based off of the compounds for that limit. So if someone is having to treat for PFOA, PFOS, and they do granular activated carbon, they are going to, ideally, if we look at just the basic properties and what drives removal, it would be anything that is going to be similar in terms of size and higher. We do have some size thresholds that um, we can look at. As far as quantifying those benefits, I think that'll be more qualitative because we don't have standards and it would be challenging. But I think we could definitely talk about in, in some capacity, future proofing, if there's any other constituents that are brought in that would require treatment. That, that example exactly is the trihalomethane mm -hmm. would be reduced by granulated activated carbon. And that could be a significant benefit that would, to me, be important to consider if you can. Yeah, well, that would typically be after disinfection, correct? 
THMs. Yeah. So odds are they would probably do that upstream, but it would take out the organics that then would interact in the disinfection process. So yes, you're, you're correct on that. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, the next item is a revisitation of one that we spent some time on. Um, EFMOAA is one of the compounds that's uh, in the important in the state of North Carolina, but for which uh, EPA doesn't have on their short list for immediate action. Um, between August and December 2022 is when the, we were last asked to weigh in on the scientific adequacy of two studies as a basis for setting a reference dose over the course of those three meetings. And then in April 2023, in a document that we provided written feedback on, we decided not at that time that the scientific basis was inadequate. Uh, it wasn't that we needed more data. It just that was that neither of the studies available at the time was going to be sufficient. But we, we concluded that uh, written recommendation with the um, advice to revisit this compound fairly soon because we knew of work that was in the pipeline about to be published that may in fact have provided the dose response foundation, mammalian dose response foundation for rulemaking. So uh, we had done this one earlier. We had decided that the two studies available at the time, one epidemiological, one rodent immunological, but which failed to find effects even at the highest concentration were not yet adequate, but we knew more was coming. So Franny is going to update us on what has happened since uh, April 2023. Uh, yes. So um, there is a, a recent publication that looked at PFMOAA in rodents, and it was published at the end of 2023, um, and that's what I'm going to summarize for you today. Um, so I have just the same kind of bit of history that um, Tom just summarized, but last year and two years ago, um, we had a bunch of meetings about PFMOAA and the two existing peer-reviewed publications that were available at the time. Um, the questions we asked the board were if these studies were you know, of high enough quality and provided sufficient scientific information to determine a point of departure and derive a reference dose at the time. Um, it's a very abridged response, um, but the two studies, the board determined the two studies were of high quality um, and would preclude their use, but it did not have enough information to derive a reference dose. Um, the board recommended pausing our efforts to derive a reference dose until the, um, there was one publication we knew about that was in prep at the time. And then this is the publication I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a different publication that has happened since then. Um, but in the interim, the board suggested that we continue to refresh our literature search and kind of look into the available scientific information routinely to see what else was available. Um, this is an incredibly abridged version of that response. And so the links to the meetings and the discussions um, are here. And this will be posted on the SAB website for anyone that wants to listen to those discussions in full. Um, okay, so the paper I'm talking to you about today is one that was published, actually, I guess at the beginning of 2024, um, by Dr. Justin Conley, the EPA, and the group of scientists that he works with. Um, this paper's title is Maternal and Neonatal Effects of Maternal Oral Exposure to PFMOAA During Pregnancy and Early Lactation in the Sprug Dolly Rat. And so this is a um, maternal dose reproductive study. Um, this is the graphical abstract, and uh, I'm going to talk to you more about all of the details of this. But um, there is one thing I wanted to say for um, any members of the public that are listening or anyone that is unfamiliar with mammalian toxicology studies. Um, this is a, a study where animals were dosed with a chemical to elicit a toxic effect. These doses are higher than what is generally considered environmentally relevant, and that's done for the purpose of eliciting a toxic effect. This is a very standard and routine approach. The study met all of the guidelines set out by IOCUC um, and the governing bodies that protect lab animals and make sure these things happen in um, the most appropriate fashion. Um, I'm not gonna talk about any of the specific animal care and husbandry methods. I'm just gonna go a very high level of 
methods, results, and kind of conclusions, but I, I want to make that clear that this was done very much in accordance with all of the, the highest governing bodies for lab animal science. Okay, so the methods for this, I think, um, were detailed, but I'm going to make them very simple. So this particular strain of rat, the frog dolly rat, um, was dosed a range of um, concentrations of PFMOAA um, beginning on gestational day eight, so eight days into pregnancy, and then all the way to postnatal day two, where lactation had started. Um, the authors then compare these results for PFMOAA to those that they previously reported in a publication from 2023 that highlights the results of PFOA and Gen X in the same rat species in the same kind of dosing structure. The, the first set of results that I'm gonna explain to you are here. And so the first results are that the newborn pups displayed reduced birth weight um, at the doses of 30 milligrams per kilogram and greater, um, depleted liver glycogen um, at all doses and hypoglycemia at the highest doses of um, 125 and above. There were also numerous significantly altered genes in the liver associated with fatty acid and glucose metabolism. This is very similar to the gene changes that were produced by Gen X in their previous study. Pup survival was also significantly reduced at the two highest doses, so 125 and 450 milligrams per kilogram. At the end of the study, when they necropsied these animals, both the maternal animals and the neonatal animals displayed increased liver weights, increased serum aspartame aminotransferase, or AST, and reduced serum thyroid hormones at all doses. So all doses above zero elicited these three effects. The pups also displayed highly elevated serum cholesterol at all doses above zero. Um, these are some toxicological results that are typically associated with some PFAS compounds, um, particularly the elevated um, cholesterol and the altered um, liver proteins and liver weight. Um, when these results are compared to the previous uh, publication from this lab's results of PFOA and Gen X. Um, the PFMOAA concentrations in both the serum and the liver increased with the maternal dose increasing in both the maternal animals and the newborn animals. And this was similar to the results they reported for PFOA, PFOA, but considerably greater than the changes they reported for Gen X or HFPO dimer acid. The authors then calculated the 10% effect levels for this compound and the previous compounds. And so that's the ED10 or the EC10, um, as well as a relative potency factor for these three compounds uh, using PFOA as the index chemical. Um, as you well know, this is something that is done for um, PCBs and other classes of chemicals when we have a large group of chemicals and we only have toxicological information for a subset of them. Among the three compounds, based on the maternal oral, oral dose and the maternal serum concentration. So the 10% effect level and the relative potency factor were based on the dose given to the pregnant female rat and her blood serum concentration. Reduced pup liver glycogen, increased liver weight, and reduced thyroid hormone levels in both the maternal animal and the baby animals were the most sensitive endpoints modeled for this. So those were the endpoints they used to derive these relative potency factors and the effect levels. All right, when they compare PFOAA, PFMOAA to PFOA and Gen X, um, PFMOAA was three to seven fold less potent than PFOA for most of these endpoints based on the maternal serum relative potency factors, but slightly more potent for increased maternal, so mom, animal, and pup liver weights. PFMOAA is a maternal and developmental toxicant in the rat and produces a constellation of adverse effects similar to PFOA and Gen X. So while it is less potent than PFOA, it produces slightly more potent impacts for liver weights than PFOA does, um, but it produces 
very similar effects to those that were reported by the same group for PFOA and Gen X. What else do I have here? Oh, okay. So that is my very high level summary of this paper. Um, that's it. Um, so this is a significant contribution to the literature base. Previously, we looked at these two papers. So the Woodleff et al. 2021 paper and the Yao et al. 2020 paper. Um, this Connolly 2024 paper is a significant contribution. It is a, one additional, so now there are three. Um, with this being a significant contribution, I think it deserves um, our attention and our review. Um, we can share this paper with the board if anyone doesn't have it already and hasn't read it, um, just so we can have a more detailed discussion in the future about it. Um, we can also invite Dr. Connolly to present this work in more detail to the board and to answer any questions you may have about this particular study. Um, I'm, I shouldn't be answering the questions about this, especially since Justin is um, so close by. I think he would be willing to come give us a presentation. Um, his lab has also produced the PFOA and Gen X results that they infer to in this paper. And they have a 2023 paper that also includes NAFIAM byproduct too, which is one of the Camor signature compounds. Um, so that uh, is a very quick summary of, of a very detailed paper. Um, I can try to answer questions, but. Uh, Thank you, Franny. I've got just a couple. Sure. Um, I couldn't quite read what the dosing was. So I'm how sorry. was it administered? It was, let me go back to the big. Um, the doses were given, um, it was 0, 10, 30, 62.5, 125, and 450 milligrams per kilogram per day. Those were given by oral gavage to the maternal animals starting on gestational day eight, so eight days of pregnancy, all the way through postnatal day two, where lactation had already started. Gotcha. Yeah, I couldn't read oral gavage on the slide from where oh, I was sitting. Sorry. Was it the next one? Did I have it on there? Yes, oral lavage from gestation day. Good, uh, that helps. And then also, um, I agree with the recommendations in terms of uh, hearing more about it from the study author. Uh, I had two questions, uh, one for you and um, Assistant Secretary Macemore probably, another one for Jamie. Uh, so I'll start with Jamie's first. At the time we were doing this review of PFMYA, I think we understood that there was going to be another one coming out from ECU as well. So am I right, Jamie, that there may be additional um, studies to review, in which case that might influence the pace with which we revisit this compound? This is, I anticipated this question, and this is the never-ending <laughs> paper. No, so it has still not been submitted, and that is because one of our collaborators redid some of the serum chemistries and urine chemistries. We had originally sent our urine and serum out to a commercial lab for testing, but we got different results from a chemist who, with whom we were collaborating. And so they redid their results. They are confident of their results. They also have liver concentrations. So we need to update the serum and urine concentrations and then write a new section for the liver concentrations so we're in the process of doing that. And I have a meeting with my collaborator actually tomorrow to discuss the depth of those revisions. So that's where we are now. Uh, it still, hopefully within a, a month or two, we'll be able to get those, those sections finished and get the paper out for submission. Yeah, well, great. Yeah. Somewhere along the line between the time that it's submitted to be reviewed or accepted, presentations on the same day, um, revisiting this compound might be in order. And then my question for the department, and then I'll open it up, is um, what would be the pace with which you'd want the board to revisit something like this? Because it sounds like the existing regulatory actions on the compounds that we discussed so far are taking a fair amount of bandwidth. Is this like um, something that would be done in parallel or would be done subsequently to how the other ones move? just in terms of gauging pace. I think if David Howard could speak, he would say PFMOA is a major concern to the citizens and residents of lower Cape Fear counties. 
So for us, uh, if the scientific data is there, we want to be at least looking at that to determine uh, what a safe level is in drinking water, or what a cleanup level could be um, by systems that are ultimately filter filtering PFAS. Um, so if the scientific rigor is there, the data is there, the studies are adequate, we want to be able to apply that uh, in producing an RFD as soon as possible or a cancer slope factor if that's reasonable. Yeah, thanks, super. That could be, I mean, if you remember the rationale from April 23 was that the only live animal study largely presented no effects data, so we didn't have a bracketed dose. And then the other one was epidemiological and correlational with some, some limitations. So it wasn't that we didn't have enough, is that we didn't really have anything that we thought would fit the model, and this certainly sounds like it could. Are there any questions for Brandy on her summary or recommendations on a path forward? It would be a subject that could be amenable even before we meet again to a virtual presentation. All right, well, thank you. Um, we have one last item on the agenda, uh, which is an update on the 1,4 dioxin rule. And um, how are we doing for time for you guys? You wanna go ahead and start this one? Yeah, sure. All right. The, uh, and thank you, Franny, for the previous presentation. I think we can follow up on the action item of getting a presentation from Justin uh, whenever it's appropriate for the state, either the next meeting or perhaps virtually. The, in the introductory comments from uh, Assistant Secretary Mace Moore, she mentioned the 1-4 dioxane drinking water work that the state is doing, and Franny has a deeper dive on that now. Yeah, um, so I'm going to give you an update on this human health risk assessment that we've uh, mentioned to the board before um, and the report that we're working on and kind of the approach that we've taken and where we're looking at as far as next steps and meeting our regulatory or our legislative deadline. So I'll give you a little history on 1,4-dioxane first. Um, this um, whole scope of work really started when the EPA issued the third unregulated contaminant, monitor contaminant monitoring rule in 2012. Um, UCMR3 required monitoring for 30 different contaminants, um, two of which were viruses, in drinking water between 2013 and 2015. Um, this was th the third one of these that happened, and these come out of EPA every five years or so. We're now on UCMR5 that we're ha we have data for, and so uh, you know an another one will happen in a few years. 1,4-dioxane um, was included in this third um, monitoring rule, and the results were published in 2017. Um, the map below is from a publication that analyzed the UCMR3 data, particularly for 1,4-dioxane. Um, I'll orient you to the map before I talk about the text. Um, it's a map of the United States. The red dots are all of the systems that were found to be above the reference concentration of 0 0.35 micrograms per liter. That reference concentration is a health-based value, and that is why this publication used it in their analysis as the reference concentration. So all of the red dots are the ones above the health value of one in a million cancer risk. The gray dots are the ones that are above the minimal reporting level of 0 0.07 micrograms per liter, but below the reference concentration. And then the empty dots are below the minimal reporting level. So that was just a limit of detection. There was no additional um, exceedance in, in those sampling areas. When the authors looked at the data, they reported that California, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, and Illinois had the most public water systems that had 1,4-dioxane exceeding the reference concentration of 0 0.35. Um, there were a different number of systems in each of these states, but North Carolina was among the top states that had the most exceedances. Um, this data led to ranking the states, and these high-ranking states reevaluated the industrial sources of 1,4-dioxane and their rules um, related to water quality standards, discharge, and the limits in the permits related to these facilities. 
DEQ began monitoring across the state and many sites across the state began monitoring independently when all of this happened. Um, the table below is data that I took from UCMR3 on the website um, and then I ranked it similarly to the way that Adamson et al. 2017 ranked it. I just sorted a little differently. Um, so what you have in the far column are the states. These are just the top seven or eight uh, rather than list all of them and have the table be very small. Uh, the number of detects is next, um, followed by percent detections, the mean, min, max, and standard deviation of the values of the detections. So North Carolina is number three here, and this is because this table is sorted by the maximum concentration detected. And so if you look in that far column, which is one over from the right, um, that's the maximum concentration in micrograms per liter, um, and our maximum concentration in North Carolina for UCMR3 was 8.8. .8. Um, the minimum was the minimal reporting level. And you can see that we only had 4% of detections across the state, but still some of these values were some of the highest in the country. So this led DEQ to monitor different places. Um, a few of the places that are being monitored um, or were in the past and current in the present um, are these discharge locations. And so DWR has started sampling um, and is still sampling in most of these in um, the Greensboro um, wastewater treatment facility um, that started in October 2019 and is going through the present. Um, Ashboro has also started monitoring and sampling starting in 2021 and is still ongoing. Um, High Point, the same thing, it started in June 2022 and is still ongoing. Um, Burlington East wastewater treatment facility was monitoring from November um, 2019 to April 2020, and then there was a different agreement reached, and so there's different sampling happening now outside of DWR. Um, and then Reedsville Wastewater Treatment Facility was being monitored from October 2019 to July 2023. Um, this is just a, an example of the monitoring that occurred after the UCMR3 results came out, and many states identified that this was something they needed to look into a little deeper. As far as the legislative report goes, um, these are some of the details and the history uh, leading us to where we are today. So in September of 2023, the North Carolina General Assembly directed DEQ to prepare a human health risk assessment of 1,4-dioxane in drinking water that was supported by peer-reviewed scientific studies. DEQ must deliver this assessment to the Joint Legislative Commission on Governmental Operations no later than May 1st of this year. And this is as per session law 2023-137. To support this assessment and the report, um, you likely remember that during the 2023 December meeting, uh, we presented the legislative requirement to the board and requested assistance from some of the experts on the board. Um, at that time, the board discussed the difficulty in meeting this legislative timeline and in doing a human health risk assessment um, in such a short time frame. Um, the board also recommended a strategy to meet this requirement in the time frame given. Um, in January, DEQ followed the recommendations the board gave, and we convened a group of experts that are knowledgeable about 1,4-dioxane exposure and toxicity, and we began these directive activities. As far as the status of the report and its contents, um, I'm going to describe first the approach we are taking to accomplishing this directive, um, highlight the included experts, the advisory committee, and the designated responsibilities that each of those have, um, describe the approach to each of the sections of this legislative report, and the 1,4-dioxane data that we're including in the draft report, um, and then also explain the approach to finishing this report by the May 1st deadline. Okay, so as far as the overall approach that we're taking, we're using the EPA's human health risk assessment guidelines for decision-making, human health risk assessment for decision-making framework. Um, this is a different than just the regular human health risk assessment guidance that the EPA and other agencies put out. This is a very specific framework for decision-making and as far as its um, 
length and brevity, it's more focused. So a human health risk assessment normally would look at all of the different exposure pathways and all of the different possible outcomes and health outcomes. Um, based on the legislative directive, our purpose is very specific. And so we're able to use this framework to really tailor the pieces of this legislative report and the human health risk assessment therein to be fit for purpose. And that's really the, the main thing that separates this framework from the overall and general human health risk assessment guidance, that it's very fit for purpose. Um, this little schematic I like a lot and it um, is nice and simple, but I think it, it really shows how the fit for purpose aspect of it really is persistent throughout the entire process. And so once the, um, the question has been initiated, that's really when the fit for purpose comes in. It happens during planning and scoping, throughout the problem formulation um, and the analysis, analysis plan generation, and then continues to be considered throughout the entire risk assessment. So the decision that can be made at the end is really tailored to the regulatory question being asked. Um, so our approach is to follow this and to use it to evaluate the cancer risk of 1,4-dioxane in drinking water in North Carolina, which was the directive. The goal is to have a final report to the legislature regarding the carcinogenic risk of 1,4-dioxane in North Carolina's drinking water on May 1st. So for anyone that doesn't know, <laughs> the risk assessment has three main components. Um, the first being an exposure assessment, and so that's really just to assess where this chemical is and how people are being exposed to it. Um, the legislative directive took a lot of the ambiguity of this out, and this is usually where these risk assessments get very broad in scope and lengthy um, in their discussion. And so for this particular framework, it's really how and to what range of concentrations are people exposed and how do risk management op ops and options affect the existing conditions of exposure, um, which is, is what we're concerned about. Um, the effects assessment is the second part, and that includes this hazard identification piece, which is really understanding the adverse endpoints associated with the exposure identified in the first section. Um, and then a dose response assessment, looking at the relationship between the dose and the likely endpoint of the exposure range we're interested in. Um, there's also a component of this where looking at the mechanism of action for the stressor or the chemical is appropriate and how this mechanism of action and other relevant information affects, affects choices related to low dose extra extrapolation. And that's specifically written here in the framework guidance. Um, the risk characterization is the last part. And this is really taking the exposure assessment and the effects assessment and kind of multiplying them and figuring out what the risk is. Um, here, you really aim to answer the question that what is the nature and magnitude of the risk for these existing conditions that were already identified? and what sources and magnitude of uncertainty and variability are kind of across all of the steps of this and how certain are we of the exposure and the effects related to the exposure. Okay, so using that framework, we convened a group of experts from different places and I'm just gonna walk through the members of the team and their responsibility. Um, so I separated, let me go back, I separated all of the folks we convened into three teams for the exposure assessment, the effects assessment, and the risk characterization, and then kind of the entire report as a whole being a separate kind of review process. So the first part is the exposure assessment. And the first thing you will likely notice is all three of these people are from DEQ, and that's because DEQ has been doing a lot of the monitoring for 1,4-dioxane. Um, we have, and I didn't denote the divisions they, they work for, but Water Resources has all of this data. Um, Tammy and Jenny are incredibly knowledgeable about the entire process from UCMR3 to today um, through permitting and all of the pieces of this puzzle that come together. They've been around the whole time and have been responsible for and curating the data in a way that is usable by many entities in DEQ. And so they are really an invaluable resource in, in this process. Um, and then Jared Wilson, who is a, a member of Sushma's team, is um, a GIS specialist and a data analysis 
um, expert. He's really great at um, visualizing complex data. And so he's been integral in making this data that we have tons and tons of numbers for uh, look like something. <laughs> and that is easy to understand. Um, the effects assessment team consists of me and Dr. Kenyon. Um, we have been looking at a lot of the toxicology work that is related to 1,4-Dioxane and the cancer slope factors that have been derived through time. Um, that's really what the ex effects assessment is. It's looking at the, the toxicological endpoints and the health effects of this compound. Um, and then you'll notice the third, third team is just me. Um, and this is because... Um, Really, the text in this part of the report is just a combination of the other two teams' work. And so um, I've, through this process, tried to be very respectful of everyone else's time. And since this is a very uh, time-sensitive effort, um, I've been trying to do a lot of the work and then just have others kind of review it. And so that was the, the thought behind me, just writing the risk characterization um, and sending it out for review. Um, we have uh, a few people and entities that are going to review the complete assessment, um, one of them being Dr. Lin Linda Birnbaum, um, who is a human health expert and um, has worked, I think, for most of the, the federal agencies that do any kind of health-related toxicological work. Um, but she is also one of the folks that is affiliated with the group at Yale that does the 1,4-Dioxane human health um, toxicology work. She is an affiliate faculty member at the Duke School of Public Health right now. I can't remember what that school is called, but she's an affiliate faculty member at Duke. Um, she was at the EPA. She was at NIEHS. Um, she's a, a breadth of knowledge and has been reviewing each section as it's come to completion, but then she's also going to review the entire assessment at the end. Um, when we met in December, we also floated the idea of having the board review the report, and so I've listed the board here and I don't know that every single board member needs to review it or review every section, but we definitely want the Science Advisory Board to at least read the report before we submit it. Um, and then we would like to also have one or two external reviewers review this report. Um, I've reached out to a few that I've found on the internet, <laughs> and I've not heard back from them. So if any of you have any recommendations of who I could talk to, or if maybe just like an in, in email introduction will help facilitate someone I've already reached out to, um, that would be really helpful. Um, I just found out Detlef is at Yale today, and he <laughs> might very well be meeting with some of the people that I want to involve in this. So um, <laughs> I'll talk to him later today. Um, but yeah, if you have any recommendations, please let us know, because we are uh, actively trying to figure out who outside of state government can review these for us and give us some feedback. Um, and then we also have an advisory committee. And so we've met with the advisory the Let me start over. The idea behind the advisory committee was to kind of present the idea for what we had and the different pieces of the project and get feedback from one DHHS, and then also just a higher level of review. And so um, the four people from DHHS, um, Zach Moore, uh, Dr. Tilson, uh, Dr. Guidry, and then also Kennedy Holt, who is their toxicologist, um, have all kind of weighed in on at least the parts of the report we've finished so far. Um, and then we also have included uh, Sushma Mazemore, who's the ass Assistant Secretary for the Environment at DEQ in this because she has a lot of experience uh, with the legislative report process and exactly what that should include and the length, brevity, um, all of that. And so every time I've gotten a section of this essentially to completion, I show it to them. And then also before I start that section, I have a meeting uh, with the advisory board, so or advisory committee. Um, so that's, that's the process in a whole leading up to the actual report. Um, Here's this again. So each of these three sections, I'm gonna just kind of go through and show you the approach that we have um, and show you some of the draft tables I have um, when, I, when I have them. Um, so first is the planning and scoping piece of this. And this was the very first part. Um, it's important to note that each of the risk assessment components, each of these three sections, the content was planned and scoped to fit the specific directive given by the General Assembly. Um, the fact that the directive was so specific to 
1,4-dioxane in drinking water relative to carcinogenic risk made this a very specific and clear question to answer, which is also very helpful given the very short time frame we have to do it. So all three of these sections, the exposure assessment, effects assessment, and risk characterization sections were included in these planning steps. And each of these planning steps includes a problem formulation, which is really just distilling this problem so it's very specific to the questions being asked. Coming up with an analysis plan that details the approach to this problem, how we will analyze the data we're using, and the metrics for success and that will either serve to say yes or no at the end of the, the regulatory analysis. Um, and then finally, there are data quality metrics that are, uh, they're used at the beginning before anything is analyzed, but um, these metrics are used to evaluate the available data and determine which data is appropriate to include because not all data that's available suits this need or this answer um, or is appropriate for this specific directive that was given to us. Um, so this is a, a table that's just the draft, but I have some more details in the next slides. Um, so for the exposure assessment, um, this is our analysis plan. Um, the approach was just to describe the prevalence and exposure to 1,4-dioxane in drinking water in North Carolina um, and estimate the impacted population using all environmental occurrence data that we have. Um, the method we did for, the method we used for doing this was just to compare the environmental occurrence data to the drinking water data and calculate the percent detections, the percent detections above the proposed water quality standard and also the reference concentration that that publication used of 0 0.35 micrograms per liter. And the number of residents exposed to the proposed, to the concentrations above the proposed water quality standard. Um, the metric for this analysis was just to compare the North Carolina exposure data to the UCMR3 data that is nationwide and determine if this exposure experienced by North Carolinians is average or irregular based on the mean value and standard deviation of these concentrations reported in our drinking water from both data sets. Um, in order to do this, we had to not only use a lot of our own data, but we collected some data sets from some different drinking water entities across the state. So the data quality metrics are just part of this framework, and this is used to assess the included data and make sure it's appropriate. There are five metrics that we used for this and the subsequent section. Um, soundness, just making sure the methods are consistent with the application that it's relevant for use, um, that the assumptions, the quality assurance information, data sources, and all of that information is documented and clear, um, that the uncertainty and variability is described in the data set or methods used. So if there's not uncertainty or variability information provided with the data set, that the, the raw data is there that it can be calculated. Um, and that also that there was some kind of independent review or peer review process that happened on this data either by us or by someone else before we included it. So for this part of the report, we included surface water and wastewater from DEQ as part of our environmental occurrence data and then public drinking water systems data from DEQ, from Fayetteville Public Works Commission, from the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority, from the Pittsburgh uh, Public Drinking Water Utility, from High Point, um, Cary, Sanford, and then also we have the UCMR3 data that was collected at the entry point to drinking water systems. So the UCMR3 data is drinking water data. Um, all of these data sources met all of the data quality metrics because these were all very pertinent <laughs> to our exposure assessment. Um, that's all of the exposure assessment that I'm going to share today. Um, the tables are kind of large and I figured rather than going through all of the individual numbers with you, it would be easier just to share the draft report with you. Um, so that's all of the exposure assessment we'll talk about today. Um, the effects assessment, I think, is likely of more interest to, to this group, um, and I have a little more information to share about that. And so our effects analysis plan was just to compare any existing assessments, and this is really where the Science Advisory Board's recommendation from December came in, was not to look at 
you know, a ton of different publications, but to use these large evaluations that have been done by different states or federal agencies um, and make use of those and then just look to see what has been published since the last of those has been published. Um, so we compared these existing assessments and evaluated the quality of any new data for application into the cancer slope factor models that were in these assessments. The method that we did this by was just summarizing the existing and relevant new literature and comparing the data used to derive the cancer slope factors or the toxicological values in these different assessments. Um, the metric for this analysis is really just to compare any of the new data or any of the toxicological values in the assessments to the EPA guidance for cancer slope factor derivation. I feel like I'm going through this very quickly. Um, maybe I'm not, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Yes. I'm sorry that I'm gonna have to leave in just okay. a few minutes with Elena. Okay. But the question I would have to you is, if you're gonna provide it for review, mm -hmm. when would you do that and when would you need comments back? I have it on one of the slides, um, but I'm about finished with the final section, okay. and so I'm going to send it to the work group and then share it with the board. Um, but um, soon, yeah. And it, I, I feel like we're not. If you have significant comments or concerns, I think that's one thing. But if it's just editorial kind of things, that's a different, and that can be incorporated, um, perhaps more casually. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, and so for the, the data quality of the effects assessment, this is where these data quality metrics really came into play because there were a number of different assessments that were available, um, but not all of them met the fit for purpose nature of this report. Um, there were two different IRIS assessments from the EPA, um, one from 2010 and one from 2013. One from 2013 really just updated the inhalation reference concentration and nothing else. Um, there was also a TOSCA report from 2023. Um, the European Health Group um, produced one in 2021. And then also Health Canada produced um, an assessment in 2021. And so we looked at these all and decided that not all of them were fit for purpose. Um, the 2013 IRIS assessment provided no new oral exposure information to the 2010 assessment. And so rather than use the 2020, 2013 document, we're using the 2010 document because that's where all of the meat of that data is. Um, the TOSCA assessment, which stands for the Toxic Substance Control Act, um, this report was done recently, um, but includes occupational exposure and inhalation and a lot of different exposure scenarios that are not relevant to the regulatory question that were being asked. And so the way that this report was developed, it was for a very different purpose than just drinking water. And so we're excluding this from the data or the assessments we're evaluating. But it's also important to note that the oral exposure data and the values derived in this 2023 TOSCA assessment are not changed from the IRIS assessment. There's a lot of additional things considered, but the, the oral dosing information is not different. Um, the same thing is really true of the ECA report, that it includes a lot of occupational exposures and inhalation scenarios, and that's just not related to what we're doing. Um, at the end of these reports, they kind of put everything together as one kind of exposure factor, and that's why it's not relevant. Um, the Health Canada report, though, um, is quite applicable. It looks at all of the same things that the EPA IRIS assessment does. Um, and so that was the comparison that we did with the EPA IRIS assessment and the Health Canada assessment. Um, for the data analysis piece of this, we looked at the existing 1,4-dioxane data source information and evaluated the current slope factor, der cancer slope factor information and the differences between these two sources. Um, so this is a, a table that is still in draft form but is in the report and it just very clearly lays out the differences in these reports and how they were evaluated and how the numbers came to be what they are. And uh, Dr. Kenyon made this and it was very, very nice. It's much nicer than the one I made. So this is what's in the report. <laughs> um, 
So that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, as far as the risk characterization goes, um, this is really just where you multiply the other two sections and, and make a conclusion. And so the approach for this is to compare the exposure data with the cancer slope factor data um, and see what the actual risk is. The method that we're using is just determining the risk based on the mean concentration, the 90% confidence interval of the mean that people are being exposed to falling above the derived water quality standard based on the appropriate cancer slope factor values. Um, I'm also using a margin of error, margin of exposure calculation to determine if these different exposure scenarios will have health impacts. And so this is a really interesting method and it um, gives you a, a very high value, um, but it's, there are um, thresholds of these margin of error calculations where say something is likely to have an impact or not likely to have an impact. And so there's just, um, it's very much not on the same scope and scale as the water quality standard, but it gives you a good metric for saying impact likely or unlikely. Um, the metric we're using is the percent of the exposure data above the water quality standard will be related to the risk based on each cancer slope factor or source um, from the tox assessments, and that'll be compared to the UCMR3 data to determine how the risk in North Carolina is related to the national risk to 1,4-dioxane in drinking water. And then the margin of error results will also be used to inform the potential health impact risk and compare that to the UCMR3 data as well. Um, this is essentially all the things I just said. Um, the questions this section really aims to answer is just what is the magnitude and the nature of the risk of the existing conditions in North Carolina? Um, and then how does this compare to the national data? Is North Carolina unique in its exposure to 1,4-dioxane? Um, and also are these exposure levels that we have in 1,4-dioxane applicable to acute effects or short-term exposures or is it really just a long-term exposure scenario? All right, and so here's the timeline. There are a lot of things that have happened very quickly. <laughs> um, and so I have a, a, a bigger slide where you can see the rest of this, but you can see there are a lot of pieces of this puzzle that have already um, fallen into place. The rest of this timeline uh, is gonna happen over the next month. Um, later this week, I'm gonna share the draft, draft risk characterization with our work group uh, for review. Um, and then the following week, um, I'll have the final draft for the work group's approval and incorporation to the report, and then I'll share that draft with the science advisory board. So once the work group has looked at it one time and approved it, I'll share it with the board. Um, after the board has read it, um, we're going to have a complete draft go to DHHS and DEQ for review. And so there will still be a couple weeks between that happening and it being presented um, to the legislator where we can incorporate any edits from any of these entities. Um, but yeah, time is of the essence with this. So, um, yeah, that's what else, that was it. Um, so that is the, the plan of the path forward. Um, I do actually need to set up another meeting with our advisory committee since I'm getting the risk characterization um, section sorted out. Um, but that's, um, that is the plan and, and the path forward, so. Thank you, Franny. Awesome. Uh, any questions from you all before you have to go? Um, if you share with the Science Friday Board on the 11th, you would need comments within like 48 hours or so to be able to incorporate them if there's anything, is that right? Um, Cause you gotta have the 17th as final draft complete. Just trying to figure out the timing to, to turn around time. I think if any of the board members that are willing to review it could just read it. How long is it? In a day or two, it's only ten pages right now. Oh, I've got I've got lots of appendices, but only ten pages is the report. <laughs> um, and if there are huge issues with it, um, we can talk about it further. But yeah, sorry. No, no, that's thank you, thank you for staying for all of my Definitely. slides. Thank you very much for your preparation and participation. Very helpful. Safe travels. Are there any questions from folks on the phone, uh, Jamie, or folks in the room about the uh, work to produce this report on the short time frame that it is, as well as the ask of the board, which I'm taking it as an ask of board members? Uh, doesn't look, doesn't look like a time frame that'll be uh, used to glean like consolidated board feedback. No, unfortunately. Any questions? 
I don't have questions. I just want to really acknowledge Franny's leadership in this. This was a huge lift on a tight frame and to be able to do all that and push this forward. It's just, it's, it's very notable. So thank you for your leadership in this. It's, it's a bit uh, to do something like this on such a compressed time frame mm -hmm. is a huge deal. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And this is Jamie. I also concur with that. I don't have any specific questions. I, I think it's really fantastic that Franny pulled this together so quickly mm -hmm. as well, because as a toxicologist, I really didn't learn about 1,4-Dioxane until probably about, you know, five years ago, and there's very little information. So she really did a heavy lift, and it's much appreciated. Appreciated. And it will be tailored to North Carolina with the uh, effects of, with the exposure assessment coming first, and it will be value added um, uh, effects assessment wise by incorporating any information that's been published since the last synoptic review. So it is a good combination of fit for purpose in terms of uh, being freshened up toxicologically uh, on the effects side, but also tailored to North Carolina on the exposure side and following a EPA methodology for deriving human health guidance. Anything else? So I take it your asks, asks on this is that anybody that's on the board that knows of a potential reviewer to share that with you. And then also if board members are interested in seeing it and providing comments uh, within the time frame to let you know that. Yeah, that would be great. And I'm honestly anyone that's just willing to read it. Um, having additional eyes on it before we present it to the legislative committee would be really great. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, one more. Thing is that I think, and you alluded to this in your comments, I think we probably won't be able to say that the SAB has signed off on it yeah. as a group. I think maybe it's just been that there were some SAB members who reviewed it, but I just think from as an SAB standpoint, I think we probably won't be able to say the SAB fully endorses this just because of the time frame. We can talk through the subtlety yeah. of that. Yeah, if they want that, it would be a meeting outside of one of these that would have to be called and set some expectations as to, you know, well, how deep of a dive is it going to be? Because we have some folks that like to tear into all the data. Um, but I think, you know, we can say as a result of a presentation like today that there is nothing but positive feedback on the approach that's been taken. Uh, to the effects assessment and the exposure assessment. It's consistent with um, established policies and seems to be tailored for the question at hand. Um, and then depending on how many board members are raising their hand to review it, I don't know, maybe we could do it. So we did anticipate that there wouldn't be enough time to get official board consensus and we really just wanted to, to share it with the board and, and solicit any, you know, give an option for feedback if there was any, but yeah. Sure, and I guess your recipient who defined the time frame can always decide whether they want other people to review it. That's true. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Franny. And do you, since I don't see Paula, know whether anybody has signed up for the public forum since we started? There was none at the beginning, and I didn't see anybody come in. Then uh, since there is nothing at the public forum, we're approaching the time to adjourn. I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things. The action items that I heard so far in this meeting was to post the final minutes of the December meeting. I think Paula's gonna handle that, or Franny. Um, I will work with uh, Franny to prepare a draft summary of the PFAS reference dose discussion that we had today and the decision that we made today so that there's a written document for review. That'll be a draft for your review, uh, a document that, that summarizes our discussion on comparability, comparability and adequacy. Um, I do think it's a good idea for uh, Franny to distribute Justin Conley's paper on PFMOAA, given what we heard from Assistant Secretary Macemore about uh, the ability to move two things at once, potentially, so we can get uh, at least looking at that and looking to having Justin address the group. And then the last two things I just mentioned, share any potential 1-4 docs and reviewers with Franny as well as uh, your willingness uh, to review this on the time frame that she provided. Anybody else think of anything else that we had action item wise? I think that's it. So with that, I'll thank all the board members again for attending for the preparation and reading the materials and the charge and the spreadsheet. I think it did make for a productive discussion this morning for 
sticking with it today for the for the um, for the uh, presentations. Thank you to Jamie too on the line and to uh, Franny for preparing the agenda, to Paula for all the logistics, and to Peter who jumped in to uh, handle all the IT first thing this morning and then sat here all day to make sure it ran smoothly. Thank you very much. With that, it would be appropriate to entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Uh, move to adjourn. All right. Thank you very much. Our next meeting is in uh, August, and it'll be right here, Wednesday, August 7th, in this room. Thanks again. <laughs>